Put on your big Hollywood sunglasses and light the torch, because it's cellar time. Welcome to the Crack Cellar, as the prophecy was foretold. I'm Two-Spirit Penguin Daniel. And I'm Broadcaster Nichols. And today, we discuss The Last of Us Leaks, where to the dismay of Broadcaster Nichols, there is no genital slider. I am woman, hear me roar. Alright, and I need a laser dick cannon. No, I need a bow and arrow dick. I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> Whoa, Maybe... That- I mean, isn't it bow and, arrow, bow and arrow themed? I guess she has a gat. Whatever. I'm not. Obviously, I'm not a Last of Us fan. <laughs> uh, neither am I. Um, I played, uh, let's see, two hours of the first Last of Us. And I was scratching my head wondering what the hell everyone saw in this game. Because I had no shortage of people convincing me to play that game like everyone at the time when it first came out was just like you have to play it it's the greatest game ever made blah 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 i thought it sucked ass the sequel was never even on my radar but uh i did notice a few e3s ago uh i don't know if it was last e3 or the one before they did a last of us 2 trailer reveal and i immediately noticed that it went super woke right off the bat I believe there was like an interracial lesbian kiss and a few other kind of eyebrow raising things that had nothing to do ostensibly, I think, with the original Last of Us. And it seemed like it was, you know, just put in there for woke points. Yeah, well, that was when the idea of the main uh, male figure from the first game there was a rumor going around that he was going to get killed off. A bunch of people were really upset about that. And then that that demo came out, that showcase came out and it illustrated that like, I don't know her name, Ellie or whatever her name is. Um, <clears throat> she was going to become like more of the main lead and with her like lesbian girlfriend essentially. But I don't want to like say this definitively, but I think like something came out or something leaked a lot leaked, I guess, but that bitch dies. Or something like that, and it sets off like this crusade for revenge. I didn't really look into the leaks too much because I don't give a flying fuck. But yeah, a lot of people are upset out there. And, yeah, uh, I can't help but laugh because I thought the first game was it. It wasn't bad in my opinion. It was highly overrated. I've I played plenty of it. I was just like, this is. I don't know. It's like uncharted meets. Sur- like kind of like survival horror almost not so much horror because it's not but yeah. i don't know it's it's somewhere in that somatic add a little somatic uh, realm to it and it, I, don't, I think that's what you get but yeah i just didn't like i didn't like what i saw and i wasn't impressed and damn, the amount of awards it got was just unbelievable it's so <laughs> overrated yeah, I felt that way too. And when I when I saw the trailer at E3, I just rolled my eyes super far back behind my head, but I didn't care really. It was more just like a okay, cool, another woke game that I wasn't going to play anyway, but now I'm definitely not going to play. And when these new leaks came out, as soon as I heard there were leaks, I didn't even know, I need to know what they were about. I instantly knew that the leaks were that it was going to be super SJW based. And that of course, the, that's entire, what it is. the entire game was just going to be totally retconned to be like a leftist uh, fantasy land. No, nah, dude. I mean, sometimes I feel like we're in like this somewhat weird groundhogs, semi groundhogs day type event where we just wake up every day and we see what these wily SJWs do next, you know? Yeah, I don't. I, and I, I'm not. I don't want to discuss the the details of the leaks too much, like in specific, in a way where it would indicate spoilers. I'm not like trying to uh, spoil the game for someone that some poor soul that's actually going to buy this piece of shit. But <laughs> I mean, I think the the basic idea is that what happened is that the game was hijacked by an, a super SJW director type that's big in the video game industry right now. And 
basically, as soon as this guy hijacked Last of Us 2, he immediately brought on Anita Sarkeesian as a quote unquote consultant. And what that really God. means is that they are paying her money to have her name associated to it so SJWs will like them. That's essentially yeah, it's what's mafia. happening. It is it's, mafia. It, it's mafia. Yeah, Anita Sarkeesian, you'll see her, and I've seen this happen maybe four or five times, where a famous video game developer will make a comment that's anti-SJW or maybe questioning it a little bit where they're not going to kowtow and they're just kind of like, why are we doing this? Why, why is this wrong? Like what, what's going on here? And you'll see Anita Sarkeesian submarine into the thread and be like, hello, I think that I could help you find the solution to your problem and bring your game into the light. Please contact my representatives. We can work out a deal. God. This is the it same sounds thing. So mafia. This is it's same, protection. <laughs> it's the same thing as some guy walking into your bodega store and being like, "Hey, uh, it'd be a real shame if someone came in here and uh, broke all your shit, huh?" Man, it only costs like a hundred bucks to stop that. Wouldn't that be worth it? It's super weird. Like I don't even know how. <laughs> I've seen that play out multiple times. You remember the? Oh God, what was it called? What was it called? Bully Hunters. Did you ever see that? I think Anita, Anita Sarkeesian was actually a part of that. Yeah. She like sponsored it in some weird way. Like she's been, she's been attached just to some absolute cringe where like beyond cringe. Like we're talking about the edge of the edge of cringe reality. All right. <laughs> Since we're, yeah. She operates in cringe. Pro- That's like yeah. her home is cringe. Yeah. But, uh, so so what happened with this leak is interesting. Uh, it was an employee that leaked it. But as soon as the word got out that it was an employee who leaked it, all of a sudden, all the major M5M video game news outlets all simultaneously came out with this stunning report where they're like, no, th- there was no employee who leaked it. This is outside of the purview of the company, and it is an unknown actor that has nothing to do with any of our companies, blah, blah, blah. Dude, it read like a fucking uh, press that. release. It read like a press release from the gaming company itself, from Naughty Dog. That's what it read like. So I'm guaranteeing you that they paid these outlets to run this story with their verbiage to throw people off the scent that their entire employee workforce hates them and they are working under shit conditions and they're fucking revolting because they're pissed off that they worked like dogs for years on a game that they know is going to tank like the Titanic. Yeah, it has to be just so demoralizing coming into work every day, just being an absolute treated like an absolute fucking Muppet. Yeah. <laughs> just to build garbage like that is fucking... <laughs> Yeah, I can't I can't put myself in their shoes because I've never been there, but it's just like, God, uh, yeah. how long can a human yeah. being do that for? Wasn't there like a 70 percent or 80 percent uh, quit like uh, the workforce quit at one point just abruptly for Naughty Dog? Yeah, hmm, I don't know. It's a good question. I think I'm pretty sure that happened. like they had a, a mass uh, walkout. And I think it played out before all of this came to light. You know, so I'm starting th- to remember that what you're talking about vaguely. Yeah. I think there was something like that, but I don't really remember what happened or what come came of it. Man, because you have to think. I mean, it, their bonuses have to play into the how well the game does, you know. And for just a year after year, you're putting your grinding right, just putting in those hours instead of spending time with your family and shit, mm-hmm. and. You're just like, well, it's for the bonus, right? It pays off. It's going to pay off. And then Anita Sarkeesian comes along and just says, excuse me, I don't see enough bender gen- or gender bending roles in here. <laughs> We're going to have to fix this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's honestly just perplexing. The industry just must not be in- interested in like truly making money anymore because these companies know these games aren't going to sell. They know it. Uh, Mass Effect Andromeda essentially proved it years ago. Nobody I think wants they were these still kind of tone deaf back then. Well, I could see being about it back then because there's this perception created by the M5M that everyone agrees with SJW bullshit. Everyone's on board. And the only people that aren't are alt-right Nazi quadroons. Uh, no, that's not true. There are lots of left-wing people that do not agree with SJW crazy bullshit. 
and the vast majority of video game players, real gamers, are not on board with it. And so these games tank, and they know it now. Like, there's the numbers are out there. You can look at the games that embrace it, and they all tank. Now, we have a company, Naughty Dog, that is just renowned for how good of games they make. Everyone loves Naughty Dog. They know the numbers. They know how toxic Anita Sarkeesian is. They bring her on anyway to ruin their new flagship franchise that just got off its feet. How how can you do this as a company? It's like shooting yourself in the head. Held hostage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's honestly how those people, that's how they deal, man. I think they get like, uh, I mean, I don't want to put the tinfoil hat on too much, but. I mean, when I see like people like Anita and their what they some people may say what she stands for and what she actually she represents and does, but on paper what she actually does yeah. is very mafioso type shit, yeah. right? And you you look at a, ki- a person like that and it's just like how how do you get your teeth and your hands around these titans like that? How did you walk into a fucking an in-house Sony developer and Mm. just tank a a huge franchise, a a console selling franchise. May I say, you know, it, it, whether, what we, whether we like the game or not, it's a huge title. It makes money. (laughs) It's like, you have to think your conspiracy hat goes on a little bit and you're just like, well, she had to have some type of fucking angle. She's had to have uh, in Numerous angles. If you look back in the history, I think there was when Gamergate was happening. Didn't she have some type of connection with all that? Oh, yeah, she was. Didn't she come out of Gamergate? Wasn't that her whole thing? I know there was that other female journalist. I forget her name, but yeah, I'm um, I'm pretty sure Anita was essentially born. Her social media status was born from Gamergate. It was. She started with feminist frequency but yeah, I believe that came out yeah. right around when Gamergate was happening. I don't know. I think it was before, but I don't think it was popular. I think yeah. that she sort of became the rallying cry from the SJWs. Like they kind of just got behind her as their like sail ship going, you know what I mean? Going into battle. Like they just propped her up and uh, Zoe Quinn is the other one. Now Gamergate, this is interesting. So Zoe Quinn, that's her name. Yeah. So, If you really want to talk about what Gamergate really was, basically, Zoe Quinn made this vaporware, shovelware uh, indie game that probably took her two weeks to put together. I, I saw it myself. It was hot garbage. And she slept with a reviewer at Kotaku. The point of her sleeping, and by the way, she she had a boyfriend or a husband. I don't know which. I think it was just a boyfriend, but I'm not sure. And so she cheated on him with this Kotaku employee solely so she could basically buy favorable reviews for her game that no one knew about, that no one was ever going to hear about. But this Kotaku writer is like, okay, you're fucking me. I'm going to go ahead and put this review out. I'm going to give it great reviews, and you're going to get hundreds of thousands of views on your game for this. And that's what she did. The boyfriend found out. He got all of the proof. So basically what happened here is they exposed a very shady, not even a real game developer. I don't even think she might have not even made the game. She might have had some boy toy make it for her. I'm not even convinced she even made the game because she's never made a game since. There's no indication she knows anything about programming at all. So in my opinion, it's very suspicious whether or not she even made the game. But she she slept her way into a positive review at Kotaku, and this kicked off a very angry mob of gamers that were already fed up with bought and paid for reviews. We, Me and you have been talking about this for a long time. Video oh, yeah. game reviews have been bought and paid for forever from since the, yeah, the Game Pro the days. Yeah, from the Game Pro days. Better. If anything, though, it's gotten better and better, though, because it used to just be straight up normal. Well, reviews were just bought and paid for. You know, you got in a magazine, you were just like, that's just, you left it up to the, the credibility of the article writer, the journalist, you know? Yeah. I think it's always been a problem. I don't know if it's gotten better or not, but I know for sure it is still a problem. And this whole thing set off this powder keg with all these people that were just sick of it. They're sick of unhonest, unethical game journalists. And so they lambasted Kotaku 
and they lambasted this woman. And what ended up happening is that the M5M media caught on to this, realized like they were in tough shit, and they played the play of the century. They flipped it around using SJW doctrine to make it, oh no, there's nothing untoward going on here. It's just that a bunch of alt-right Nazi quadroons on Twitter are harassing this poor, innocent, young game indie game developer named Zoe Quinn, and that's what Gamergate is. It's all about misogyny. And how does Anita fit into all that? Anita was basically a defender of Zoe Quinn. Uh, she came onto the scene, defended her, used it as an opportunity to promote feminist frequency, and basically catapulted herself into the SJW video game media stratosphere. And so, like you said now, she is a gangster. She just goes around saying, eh, it'd be a real shame if someone review bombed your game for being racist. You better hire me. <laughs> That's what she does, dude. She made a cottage what? industry out of it. Yeah, dude, the gaming industry is just so grimy nowadays, man. You you look you look at examples like this, and then you look at examples like you know the whole Twitch thing that's going on right now with Valorant. It it's like I'm not even a Twitch streamer, you know. I dabbled in streaming just to see if I liked. It was all right. Kind of figured out my hardware wasn't adequate, moved on, you know, whatever. But nonetheless, I don't know if you've read too much about this, but it's kind of nasty. The like this developer of Valorant, I don't, who makes it? It's the people that did uh, Counter Strike, right? No, the no, Steam. no, no. It's the people that made League of Legends, Riot Games. Uh, of, and one important uh, okay. thing to know about Riot Games is they are owned by Tencent, the Chinese gaming mm, super conglomerate. Yes. Where the a lot, looming Chinese company, yes, where a lot <laughs> of the bad stuff is coming from. A lot of the games that are doing bad things right now all are under this umbrella of kind of Chinese money, Chinese ownership. Uh, fucking bl- we talked the other day, Blizzard just took a huge investment from George Soros. Oh, God, I can't wait to play Diablo 4. Uh, Broadcaster Nichols, did you view the Valorant Twitch sc- scammer, I mean, uh, streamers, did you view their, their scam stream? Fuck no, dude. <laughs> I could give a shit about Valorant for one, all right? <laughs> it's I'm not, not in. I'm just not into it. I looked at it. I'm like, okay, I'll get, I'll play it when I'll play it. I'm not excited for it. And two, I, I'm not. I, when you try to buy people, it, it just, it's so apparent. You know, it's like when you meet someone that's trying to be too extra, too fake. You know, you don't have to lie to kick it. Type mm-hmm. of shit. You know, yeah. it's the ty- that shit just immediately grinds against my soul, and I'm just like, yeah. you know what? I don't want to play your shitty fucking game now. Because I see what you're doing here. (laughs) It makes me not like them more. And and it'd be one thing if it was fair. Like, if every single person that went to this stream uh, got their code. Maybe we should clarify exactly what we're talking about here. Essentially, there's stream dumping going on where uh, Riot Games is handing out beta keys that you have less than a 1% chance of getting uh, if you watch uh, certain streamers while they stream the game, you know? So you're getting all these views and potential subscribers, you know, aka giving all these kids fucking money for the potential of getting to play this beta. Anyways, move on. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And so it it would be one thing if all the people that were bribed into viewing these Twitch streamers got their code, got their invite to the beta like they did it for Okay, I still think it's kind of gross, but okay, whatever. You, you, it was a fair transaction, okay? I don't judge the guy who goes and fucks a hooker, you know? One person paid, the no, other person's going to pay in another way. <laughs> right, exactly. So it's fine, but here's the thing. It was a fucking scam. Like, 1% of the people that participated in this actually got an invite to the beta. It was very, very poor form by Riot. They basically used all these people and spit in their faces there's no reason they couldn't have given more invites out they're being oh, pieces for of sure <laughs> and now it's like it's like when you give the government uh more uh, more power you know now that valorant's come out to set the president for this type of thing all these all these game devs are gonna be doing that now oh yeah you know it's the the pipeline has been open it's Indeed. coming down yeah, and, and, and that's yeah that disappoints me the most yeah it is disappointing, and uh, speaking of disappointing, uh, 
the Xbox One gameplay premiere. You're telling me that, <laughs> that this uh, this huge landmark event uh, apparently had no gameplay in it. Uh, please explain, they, Broadcaster Nichols. They officially said it was poor performance. <laughs> they went. I think they tweeted it or something. I was I was watching a, another YouTuber and they were talking about it and they uh, they referenced some uh, some official statement by Xbox saying how they thought it could have been better essentially <laughs> that's how, that's how bad it turned out but i mean it's you can't kind of blame them on one side of the coin because it was all stream you know uh, i don't know who was hosting it this maybe a lot of xbox fans know who he was but i didn't pay attention to that some guy was streaming it from his home essentially as the host and he was just going through all these clips of you know some were pretty big games some were not. Some were brand new IP. Well, one in particular was a brand new IP that looked pretty dope. But the key thing for this whole uh, preview or showcase, however they want to call it, was is that they said each video was gameplay. They kept on saying that. They're like, now watch some gameplay of insert video game here. And it was not that at all. In fact, maybe a few of the games had... I would say maybe at most 10% of what they showed was gameplay and it was super quick and not really, you know, something you could go off of. <laughs> and it was just, it was just laughable. I don't really want to spoil the games for it because if people want to go see it, I don't want to do that, but it, it's just, it was sad. It was really sad, especially if you're an Xbox fan, I, I could probably just hear the tears <laughs> dropping on the ground. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's important to note that neither of us are really Xbox fans. Like you were into it for Halo for a while. And, I'm still uh, in. I mean, I, my heart's still there. But I mean, you haven't I, owned an Xbox since like the 360, right? You don't have an correct. Xbox one. Correct. So, well, uh, Dirty Randy Productions does. Right. So, so I do have Halo 5 at my side. Okay. All right. Well, you're, you're kind of dabbling, but you're not like you used to be where you were kind of all about Xbox for a while. I have never owned an Xbox in my entire life. I did have a friend that had an ex original Xbox that I played a lot with, uh, original Halo, Halo 2, uh, Knights of the Old Republic, the classics. Xbox, the original Xbox did have some really good games. But the 360, Absolutely. the 360, I never got into. I know it has, it also has a bunch of good games. I just never got into it. And Xbox One was a joke. It was dead on arrival for me, so I didn't even consider it. Uh, this next gen, I might go Xbox. Uh, but this whole gameplay premiere debacle is <laughs> making me very much rethink that. I bet you it's really making Sony feel good about keeping their cards close to their chest this whole time. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They probably saw that showcase and they just like stopped sweating. They're just like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we will attack soon. <laughs> so do so you, th you think uh, Microsoft is going to actually suffer any loss because of this debacle? Do you think that because Xbox fans are kind of like a cult? They're very culty. They are console fans are like cults. Let's be real. Kind of, but I've noticed that Sony people are kind of more uh, mercenaries nowadays. I feel like because the PS4 is so penetrating into the market that everyone has one. So I feel like the PS4 almost is just this like ambivalent little blob that doesn't really care anymore because it's eaten everything else. But the Xbox people still have a chip on their shoulder. They're when I meet Xbox fans and I tell them I don't own an Xbox and I've never owned an Xbox. That's how X Xbox fans have always been. They look at me like always. a goddamn heretic, dude. They look at me it like, is. how so dare you? But will the Xbox cult actually make Microsoft pay for this? Do you think there will be a drop in sales? Do you think there will be backlash, like real backlash? Not backlash from people like me that don't really care about console wars, but backlash from their own? Um, no, I don't. I mean, I... I'm probably I probably have a little bit more faith in the Xbox te the team over there just because I feel like Xbox is trying to push the envelope in a different area of gaming streaming to be more matter of fact, you know, so they have a lot more cards on the table than Sony does. You know, Sony is just really concentrating on the PS5. They don't have portables. They don't have a, 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 a 
you know a new VR headset they're trying to compete with. They don't have, um, you know, I guess that's it really. But Xbox is trying to do streaming. They're trying to turn their console into like integrated uh, home entertainment device with you know weird gimmicky peripherals that come out all the time for it. It just, they, they seem for a second there, I would say Xbox was lost in the woods. But now, what you with, don't like the Connect? <laughs> oh God, <laughs> you mean the Natal? <laughs> but uh, you know now they have like the cloud farms and stuff like that. And I I think they're in the next few years they're really going to position themselves to take off with uh, streaming games. Like I think they're going to smash right past Google and Sony in that aspect. Hmm. Interesting. But I don't think Sony gives a fuck, like you said earlier. I don't think Sony, they have so much market penetration with the PS4, and I think they're so proud of what the PS5 is going to be. I don't think they're they're concerned with what Microsoft is doing. And I forget the guy's name from Microsoft, but he made a very interesting statement, you know, that he's not trying. It, people, a lot of people said it was it was kind of uh, bullish, you know, like he was just trying to throw some some sand in some of the competition's eyes, you know, by saying that he's not trying to compete with Sony and Nintendo anymore, but he's trying to compete with Amazon and Google um, nowadays. And it kind of made me understand where Xbox is going. You know, I think they're almost, and I'll say this very cautiously, because I know there's a lot of Xbox fans out there that will get mad at this, but I think they're politely bowing out of the scene of the console wars. Mm hmm. I think they're not too concerned with exclusivity, which is why there was that huge backlash earlier in the year where they kind of came out and they said, you know, there was no exclusives to announce really. And people are just like, what the flying fuck? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now they're like, uh, the showcase was this huge push to um, look, look at all these developers we're working with. Look at all the games that are coming out. Gameplay, gameplay, gameplay. <laughs> you know, that it makes me think that they were very sensitive to what happened, but the ship did not steer course at all. It did not correct course. They know where they're going and they just think they're in the fog right now and they just need to stop being scared and just get through it. <laughs> It's sad that I've I've always wanted the you know Japanese uh, competition to win. I, I mean, I love Japanese people and stuff, but at the same time, it's just like, how can I n not like what America has to offer? It's sad. <laughs> yeah, it, it is sad, but I think it's just because of the time that we grew up on video games when it was dominated by Japanese. So that's what we like. So I grew up with the NES, the SNES the PS1, you know, like all these, basically the 90s, you know, the 90s game consoles are what I grew up with, and to a large extent, what you grew up with, and it was all Japanese all the time, like the, what was the big American game console of that time, uh, oh right, the Atari Jaguar, that, that worked out really well, didn't it? I'm sure there's a landfill somewhere out there. Yeah, there's nothing, American video game development essentially started in the year 2000 with Xbox, like it, American video games were sort of a joke outside of PC. Now, PC was always different. PC was dominated by American video games. Almost all the video games I played on PC in the 90s were American. Very, very few Japanese games on PC. They were almost strictly console. But I think the time in which we kind of became gamers steered us towards a certain type of video game, and those are basically Japanese. And Microsoft does have Japanese video games, but they don't have a lot of them, and they don't have the exclusives. If you want the exclusive good Japanese video games like Bloodborne, like Persona 5, you have to play it on PS4. And that is totally taking a huge chunk of the 90s gamers that that's what they want. They don't want, like, Quantum Break or and all these, like, weird... Uh, what was the other one? Alan Wake. I mean, yeah, I mean, Quantum Dream was. I feel like L.A. Noir was a really cool, unique game, and then everyone thought they could just start making games like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> Broadcaster Nichols, are you ready for our preview? I am. What's that? 
You want more crack, seller? <laughs> this is good. Join your lords on Twitter at the crack seller and Facebook.com slash the crack seller. Hey, you over there. Are you a straight up Chad or a strong woman? Well, you can find us on Apple Podcasts and your favorite podcasting app. Or, if you're a straight up beta cuck, find us on YouTube with the rest of the Cloud Chasers. And we're back with our preview of Clive Barker's Hellraiser. HBO TV series, of course, not the movie, which came out in the 80s. Broadcaster Nichols. This is going to be a sequel to the original two movies. It is not going to be a reboot. It is not going to acknowledge any of like the campy, weird, uh, anything after Bloodlines, I think. Anything Bloodlines or later is going to be completely ignored by this television series. And really, it's going to follow the original book, mostly, The Hellbound Heart. What do you think about that? I actually kind of liked Hellraiser Bloodlines. It wasn't the greatest movie in the world, but I I thoroughly enjoyed it and it's, you know, one of my favorites if I were to, you know, rank all of the but then again, a lot of those like Hellraiser 5 and 6 and whatever it's like they were pretty bad, so I yeah, I didn't even watch them, but they look terrible. Oh, I, I, I only watched... really remember the first two to remember to be honest, but from what I remember those everything else was garbage. <laughs> I watched all of them. Uh, one of them's I don't remember a lot about one of them other than it just being really bad and just like basically nothing happens and it's just oh the box here are the Cenobites game over you know, just, okay but one of them was super cringy because it tried to uh like incorporate YouTube and social media into it and it was so cringy and desperate. It just felt well, like there was a puzzle box app. Oh, it was, it was, I, it wasn't even <laughs> that cool, dude. It was, it, it was bad. Uh, but <laughs> that being said, they should pay me for these ideas. <laughs> that being said, uh, what is your favorite Hellraiser movie? I think it's the original, to be honest. <laughs> so mm. the plot of the mo- original movie was just so fucking cool, dude. The yeah. fact that that guy gets into, they well, what what do they call it? They try to call it like Sada something. It's like satanic or satanic worship mixed with sodomy. I don't know. They're trying to do some weird weird <laughs> shit there, but really, it was just some demon shit. But nonetheless, dude, the setup for that original movie was just so dope. The brother coming in later and then spilling the blood, you know, and it just summons the fucking brother's corpse. <laughs> and mm-hmm. this, that cheating bitch just sees his fucking corpse and she's like, I still love you. Let me feed you. <laughs> Let me feed you. <laughs> like, yeah. It was just so crazy. Yeah. Julia. Uh, yeah. I Julia. think that the actress that played Julia, she has been in so much shit. I don't know if you know a lot about her, but. She was big in like the 90s and the 80s and probably the 70s. I just didn't watch a lot of 70s movies. But man, I've seen her in so many things. But the one thing that I always think of when I think of her is the original Hellraiser because her performance in that was uh, striking. It was a striking performance. <laughs> She just, she kind of looked like the chick that would do something like yes. that, right? You look at her and you're like, yep, you would be feeding your your zombie husband <laughs> some fucking souls, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I did, I, man, I look at Hellraiser 1 and 2 kind of the same way I look at FF6 and FF7. It's like, depending on the day I wake up, one might be better than the other. It's like 1A and 1B to me. But if I do have to choose, I'm gonna go Hellraiser 2, because I think Hellraiser 2 invented high-concept horror. Before Hellraiser 2, most horror movies were not high-concept. They were very just kind of like, you have a killer, he's doing something heinous, bad, bad guy. Let's be scared and run away and eventually have a conclusion where the good guys somehow survive and win or one good guy does usually uh the rest die and then one person survives this hellraiser 2 totally broke that mold and maybe another movie did it before that 
But for me, the first high concept horror I ever saw was Hellraiser 2. And the moment you see uh, the the fucking uh, the blood the blood woman, <laughs> you see her resurrected in just flesh with no skin. Yeah. And you and you see like the way this plays out very much like the original where I need you to bring me food from this crazy fucking doctor and I I think part of it was because at the time I watched Hellraiser 2 I kind of had this weird thing with doctors. I kind of felt like evil vibes from them. I I always kind of was just skeptical of doctors and dentists. So like Dr. Giggles, I like that movie because it's about an evil dentist. And I think I kind of like the the concept of this doctor being super evil and just embracing this bitch and bringing her the food. And the way (laughs) it concludes obviously it's like you see it miles away but it's still satisfying when it happens her turning on him and then going (laughs) to the labyrinth and seeing the god in the sky the the spinning diamond leviathan and everything that happens hellraiser 2 changed what horror could be for me oh no doubt no doubt it pushed clive barker just pushed the envelope yes and you know what too Clive Barker wrote Hellraiser 2. He wrote yeah. it. He didn't write the first one. Like, he wrote the book that it was based on. So, you know, yeah. kind of wrote yeah. it. But he literally wrote Hellraiser 2. So that is 100% pure Clive Barker. Yeah, it was a true sequel. It was. And uh, I think it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Not even just, like, my favorite Hellraiser. But uh, That's a shame, because I'll be honest, I don't remember any of that. And you just telling me that kind of gave me a picture back in my head. I'm like, I need to go watch Hellraiser 2 now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like, it sounds fucking killer. <laughs> dude, there's a part in the in the labyrinth where fucking uh, Kirsty gets locked in a room with her fucking uncle, her demon uncle. And like, oh, is it Kirsty? Is that her fuck? I thought it was Christy. Fuck. I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's Kirsty. It I think it is Kirsty because I remember Pinhead saying her name. <laughs> I think that like they kind of play around with the pronunciation. Maybe it's in my head, but like. I feel like they've called her both at certain points, but I call her Kirsty. That's that's what I call her. <laughs> but anyway, when <laughs> she's in that room with her uncle in in the labyrinth, aka hell, basically, uh, <laughs> dude, there's just like it's one of like the most overt like incest rape vibes I've ever seen in a mainstream non smutty movie. Where he's just like walking towards her, like, "Oh, Kirsty, I've missed you," and like you're just, you're just oh. sitting there, like, "Whoa, <laughs> yeah, you are right." Because the same, you just rem- that is how the first one ends. The same thing happens in the first one. She does escape that hospital and she goes home. Mm-hmm. Remember, and yeah. she finds that fucking her dad has been killed in doppelganged. By her uncle, yep. and her uncle tries to rape her. Yep, 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 yep. yeah. <laughs> and the Xenobites are like, nah, dog, chains rip <laughs> apart. <laughs> They're like, Kirsty, you're coming with us. <laughs> the movie fucking ends. Yeah. Or does it? No. <sighs> no, I forget. Anyways, yeah. go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we have Hellraiser 1 and Hellraiser 2. Uh, your favorites 1, my favorites 2. Either way, they're like two of the greatest horror movies of all time. And ostensibly, this HBO TV series is going to be based on those two movies and kind of just pick up where Hellraiser 2 left off. That excites me to so no dope. end. Because that, to, to me, that means we're getting back the high concept side of Hellraiser. We're getting the Labyrinth. We're getting the Leviathan. And I could not be happier with that. I don't... I love Pinhead's one-liners. I love them. They're great. I, I quote them all the time. So do you. But that's not what truly brings me to Hellraiser. And what they are ostensibly coming with on this TV series, it seems like they're coming with that core of what really attracts me to the series. What do you think? Do you think that that is the case? Do you think that this is a little premature? Because this is all just based off of like some tidbit interviews and kind of like circumstantial evidence. There's not a whole lot out about this TV series at this point. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's hard to say. It always is with these type of things, but I would hope, I'd really hope, especially because Clive Barker is the one, you know, chattering about this. So it, it, it gives me hope that his involvement in the fact that a rumor mill is saying that it's 
disregarding everything past the second movie. That's just a perfect storm. And if the rumor mill is talking about a perfect storm, it means there's a chance out there. Someone's putting it out there in the ether, right? Yeah. That's why I always like to think, at least. Yeah. Well, I mean, you got that, which is just great news to start with. And you also have the fact that it's on HBO. Tell me, Broadcaster yes. Nichols, is there, <laughs> yeah. is there any channel you would rather have this TV series? No. And, you know. Hell no. I, I, there's like a 10% chance that the HBO show is going to be bad. They have such a good rap with shows. So mm -hmm. you, the Hellraiser IP is going to HBO. You just, you got to know it's going to be good. Yeah, it feels like it's in great hands, and also it's very unlikely to be censored unless, unless Clive Barker gets involved and he like wants to do like his sadomasochistic demon orgy shit that uh, they didn't let him do. And <laughs> I think it's from the comic books. I don't know. I've never actually read the comic books. I hear they're great, but I also hear that they are graphic. Yeah. Well, dude, didn't I mean that was Clive Barker was known for that back in the day, yeah. dude. Remember, didn't he get an X rating on the original Hellraiser? Yeah, he had to remove he a bunch of stuff. Yep. Oh yeah, like the the final scene that we talk about that we love so much, where like shit yeah. goes off. That was originally like thirty minutes long, dude. <laughs> they cut like eighty percent of it because of how graphic it was. They're so like, maybe we'll dial this back a little bit. <laughs> Uh, one of the other tidbits out about it right now is that it is going to center around Pinhead. So that means. Maybe we're... we'll get an origin story of Captain Elliot Spencer finally. Yeah, well, that could a true be... origin story. Well, yeah, they give you like the little kind of cheap version in the movies, but yeah, like a, a legit one. But do you think that they will bring back the OG Doug Bradley or do you think they're going to bring back? Uh, the guy you weren't too impressed with in Judgment, Paul T. Taylor, or Paul T. Taylor will not be coming back. <laughs> no, okay, so you, no Paul T. Taylor. Do you no. think it'll be Doug Bradley, or do you think it'll be a new guy? Doug Bradley's too old, man. He is. I doubt he wants to do it. Or uh, Pinhead is all makeup. You could get away with it with him still, because of the fact that that character is all makeup, all prosthetics. Yeah. I mean, it'd be really cool if he could pull it off, and his heart's in it, but. I Sometime. don't think it How happen. old is he? He has to be... He's probably in his 70s. 60. Okay, 70. I mean, I doubt well, they can get that man to okay, do that so shit. I feel like he was 40 when they made the original Hellraiser. So that would basically make him close to 70. That's my estimation. But I'd love it. But I, th I think they're just going to cast a new guy. Because with Pinhead... It, it, you don't have to really be too good of a casting, you know what I mean? Because if 90% of it is makeup and prosthetics and effects, you really just need the face to be right almost. And like the stature, maybe a little bit. True. And I mean, they, I mean, look at, um, what was that? The Irishman and what they do in the Marvel movies to de-age people. Uh, I mean, Moff Tarkin. <laughs> dude. It was, a, it was quite impressive what they did there. <laughs> that guy wasn't even alive. They didn't even de-age that motherfucker. They just fucking... Yeah, uh, that Moff Tarkin CG, man, that was, that was mighty impressive. Almost made me cry a little bit hearing those words. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to the laser cannon. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... Alright, so... Let's go over the established stuff a little bit real quick before we go into our crackpot theory segment. The plot, the pilot will be written by the writer of Battlestar Galactica, Daredevil, and Heroes. Uh, I know you're a fan of at least one of those shows. Uh, yeah, Dare Daredevil from Netflix. Yes. Oh, dude, awesome. Yeah, and uh, that was a good show. Yeah, and I I love Battlestar Galactica. I thought Heroes was overrated, but it wasn't yeah. bad. It wasn't like the worst show, but I didn't I like think the it was cheerleader good. girl. Oh God, she was Peyton Handier, do that chick. <laughs> she was like the Britney Spears for like the generation after us, basically. Oh really? <laughs> I, I mean, like in like the terms of her place in like the minds of fourteen to fifteen year old boys. <laughs> what I'm saying, but <laughs> not a bad uh, choice, guys. Not a bad choice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's going to be the pilot's going to be written by that guy. Then it's going to be directed by the guy who made the ritual. Did you ever watch the ritual? No. 
that was a movie that I recommended to you a while back that I said like the the uh, quote unquote villain, you know, the whatever the monster of the movie is basically the cleric beast from Bloodborne. Oh, dude. Yeah. So he made that movie. To me, that's another great sign because I thought the ritual was one of the unsung heroes of like the last five years in horror movies. No one fucking knows what the ritual is. And I thought it was one of the better horror movies that have come out in a long time. Damn. I'm going to check that out then. You should. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How's that? It's aesthetic. a good movie. I'm all about that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> There's something uh, about that type of unsightly beast. Indeed. It draws you in. And so, uh, I don't know if you know this or not. The creator of the last Hellraiser movie, Hellraiser Judgment, he wrote a script for the fourth Hellraiser movie that never got made. So originally there was going to be a fourth Hellraiser movie that was not Bloodlines, and it was called Holy War. And we don't know a whole lot about this script, but from what I have seen, it is totally based on the comic books. And the studios were like, oh, no, 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 no. This is too dark. This is we, – we're going a different direction with this. And so they, they copied uh, – what was what was the other mo- Wait, movie? Wait, are you saying this was supposed to be a true third one or a true no, fourth, fourth one? So originally okay. there was a fourth Hellraiser movie before Bloodlines came out that was going to be called Holy War that was written by the guy who made the most recent Hellraiser, Hellraiser Judgment. His name's Gary Tuncliffe. So he wrote the script Holy War, but the studio was like, hell no, this is based off the comic books, it's too dark, it's too fucked up, and they told him no, and they copied a Halloween in space, and they made, you know, Hellraiser in Odd. space. And Rest in pepperonis. And, and I liked Bloodlines, I thought it was a decent movie, I, it has a special place in my heart. But it was not like anything, it was nothing on the scale of Hellraiser 1 and 2 or 3, in my opinion. And I, I like three a little bit more than the, the average fan, but uh, even putting that aside, like there's no one that's going to tell you that Bloodlines was better than Hell on Earth. Yeah, I, it's so funny, dude, because I feel like out of all of them, Hell on Earth should have been the one I watched the most, just based on my age. Mm-hmm. But I don't think I ever watched it. Really? I think I was. Yeah, I think I was oh, living with mom, man. mom in Wyoming alone. For quite some time, and we went to the movie store. You know, I wasn't really watching horror movies because there was no one there to watch them with me. And I, th- I always remember looking at the cover of Hell on Earth because that was right around when Jason goes to hell and stuff, right? Uh, was, right was that right around the same era, or I, like? I think so. I think so. Yeah, that yeah. sounds about right. Because uh, Jason goes to hell, I think, was right before Jason goes to space. So. God, I think that, really that, the timeline makes sense there. They got so out of hand with that. Like, dude, the, the, dude, throwing 80s horror villains into space was this weird trend that I fucking love. I don't, it, I don't love it because it was good. I love it because of how retarded it was and how of the time it was. Like, looking yeah. back on it is so amusing. It was the birth of Schlock. <laughs> it was. <laughs> but uh, going back to what I was saying about Holy War. So the reason I brought up Holy War is because... Uh, Gary J. Tuncliffe is going to be involved in the TV show. There's no, he's not like the creator. He's not like a main driver, but he's going to be involved in it. And apparently the way he might be involved is that this TV series might be based off of his script, Holy War, which is originally based off the comic books, which makes sense because I've also heard that this will be based on the comic books, the TV series. The news is good. Like everything I've read that's out, and there, granted, there's not a lot. Hold the but, phone. Hold the phone. Yeah. There's a Hellraiser comic book. Oh yeah, and apparently it's like really good. Anytime I talk about Hellraiser, fifty percent chance they're like, "Have you read the comics?" I gotta go. So I gotta go see him now. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, I haven't. I've never. I've never went and seen him, but I've heard they are super graphic and they are X-rated essentially. So, uh, not for children. <laughs> But uh, we, we'll let you go on that research project and you can report back to us later, Broadcaster Nichols. Indeed. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that, I think that's basically all we know about this TV series. So that being said, do you think that this movie or this TV series do you think this TV series will be based in the 80s or 90s or do you think it'll be current time? Because there's a oh, real. It's... I think I was... it'll probably be based in current time. 
Current time. Okay. Yeah. Well, the reason that I kind of suspect it might not be is because of the success of throwback TV. So it, they're like uh, Stranger Things. There's kind yeah. of this wave of 80s nostalgia going on right now. And a lot of these shows are based in the 80s are doing really well. Hellraiser originally came out in the 80s. So if the glove fits, we acquit. Dude, you just... <laughs> Time for crackpot theories, because you just got me going, all right? You just spent up the conspiracy machine. What if they did that idea where where they did a throwback series to, like, the 80s or 90s era, and the spin on it, or maybe even go back further? I don't know where they really want to put because the originals were in well, 87, and if then If we get what, the prequel nine, to... Like that? Well, if we get the backstory, right? to uh, yeah. Pinhead, if we get his original human backstory, that would go back to, like, the 50s or 60s, right? I think that's when yeah, they insinuated that exactly. was. And then we could get some, like, Dark City type shit. Oh. Imagine some, like, L.A. Noir, or, like, some Dark City Noir type uh, style shit mixed with Hellraiser's, like, fucking superb style of horror. You know, that, that would, would be awesome. Be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope that theory turns out to be true. I do endorse that. Uh, that being said, you bring up Noir. Uh, Hellraiser has always had this kind of funny relationship between what it is. Like, it, it, it is horror. Like, if we were to define genres, genre number one has always been horror. But genre number two has kind of fluctuated between sci-fi and Noir. Now, you yeah. just brought up Noir. Do you think they're going to pivot in that direction? Or do you think they're going to pivot back to sci-fi? Or um, go straight horror, like no secondary going, uh, genre at all. Going with what HBO's history is, I would say noir. Hmm. Like HBO doesn't really have a huge sci-fi roster. And if I was ahead at, at HBO and I was thinking, you know, let's rely on what we do right and what this IP is worth. And if you see something you you've done well. You lean into that, and that out of those three things that you just mentioned, HBO does noir the best. I agree. Out of those three. So I would hope and presume that they would probably lean on that. Yeah, I agree, but then the 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 outlier in that situation is Westworld. That's a straight up sci fi. And it's, it's Western the, it, it, but it has a huge wet well, it right. did have it, a huge Western it, it, thing. Spoiler alert, broadcast equals, <laughs> how dare you? warning warning <laughs> uh yeah yeah it, it, but it is a sci-fi it, it i get your point that hbo doesn't typically do sci-fi but westworld is the outlier that is a sci-fi show even if it has elements of westerns and whatnot it is at its heart a sci-fi television show now i do agree that they're more known for noir and that it's more likely they'll pivot in that direction if i really had to you know, gun to my head, I would probably go nowhere. But I think my heart kind of wants them to go more sci-fi. I'd agree with you, but and I, and on that note, I would say the least likely is horror, just being straight horror. heavily horror, because that's I not agree. what HBO is about. Yeah, I agree. They are not about that. So I'm I'm gonna agree with you there and say it's gonna be leaning in one subgenre. We we just don't quite know yet because we don't have a lot of information. But Most uh, speaking of not having a lot of information, we don't know any characters in the show other than Pinhead. So we know it's going to involve the Cotton family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so, okay. So uh, I guess the main, uh, other than the Cenobites, the main characters of Hellraiser are Kirsty, Julia, and uh, creepy old Uncle Frank. Uh, <laughs> what was the the dude that got sacked though larry yeah larry the frank and larry <laughs> they had the most white names ever <laughs> uh, do you think any of them will return all of them one of them because i have a they're not rebooting the thing is here is that this is a sequel to the original two movies so you would think that there has to be one of those three in right they might call back to him somehow they might show up but honestly i don't want them to do that Maybe like pay like some respect or do like a pay homage to it somehow, but I don't I don't think that. Well, I think bring... it would just be too cheesy. It would yeah. be too cheesy. Like within well... like the first season, you're already getting like characters back, 
unless it was just like one time in an episode where they like go back to a past scene or something and they got a new actor playing, you know, Christy or something for a young Kirsty or, or whatever her name is. I forget. Mm. But I, I could, I could acknowledge that, but yeah, I would well, hate to see a young portrayed Kirsty by a different actor or even a, uh, unless their souls are in it, unless all yeah. these actors are all still alive and they mm-hmm. really want to come back to it. I just don't want to see these people drug into a fucking studio and like do it. Yeah. <laughs> Dance like a monkey because you were successful at one point in your life. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. And I think that if this is truly a sequel to the first two movies, then it would be really hard to bring Julia and Frank back without it being really cheesy. Like, there would have to be a Herculean effort of writing to make it not cheesy. Kirsty, on the other hand, you could do. Kirsty, I think, is the one out of the three where you could pretty easily bring her back in some capacity, and it, it wouldn't have to be necessarily cheesy. But I do like the idea of abandoning them. I, I think we can reference them. Maybe... Kirsty can be on it very rarely as like a kind of like a uh, cursory cast member that's just kind of in the background, but not the actual plot point, like the center plot point. However, one thing I will bring forth to this crack filled conversation is that Pinhead always had a very keen liking for his girl, (laughs) Kirsty. He had lots of things to say to her. And I could totally see them sort of tethering them together in this TV series. And maybe it's in the in the past and they recast her. Or it's in today, like you thought, the current day. And we have Grandma Kirsty. Maybe Grandma Kirsty has succumbed to some evil. And maybe she is cooperating with some demons she may not have in the past. I don't know. Or maybe, maybe she's doing some Sigourney... Weaver fucking Ripley action, just fighting to the death. That too. Armies, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you, dude, if you can get Linda Hamilton back for Terminator in the year 2019 or whenever the hell they release that atrocity, very true. you very can true. bring back Kirsty to, to fuck with Pinhead. Like, that is definitely doable. Who was that? If I can... Who... Was she really in anything? She wasn't. I can't remember her doing anything else besides. Oh, the Hollywood. actress who did Kirsty. Yeah, she she was. In I some remember stuff, her face, but, but she fell off. Like I don't think she's made anything recently. She, <laughs> I mean, not to take this in a morbid direction, but she might not even be alive for all I know. She, who knows? She is ripped. But uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> I don't, you said I don't it first, know. bro. I, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Oh shit. But liable. Uh, <laughs> they're they're making a new Hellraiser movie too. And I'm wondering if the Hellraiser movie might tie into the TV series or the TV series might launch the movie. Maybe the movie is a sequel to the TV series and it's a limited run. I hope not. I think it'd be much cooler if the movie actually launched into the TV series. What do you think about that? Do you think there's a chance they could cooperate? Because the rights to the TV and the movie version of Pinhead, they're owned by the same company. It's not like Star Trek, where it's split between CBS and Paramount. It's owned by one company, so they could technically weave these two together. I don't know why they wouldn't. Seems yeah, fiscally irresponsible. <laughs> but I... It... I think I would tend to lean more towards having a series capped off with the movie because I don't want to see Hellraiser turned into this long format series. I, if, if, if this Hellraiser series is going to intrigue me, it's going to be short and sweet. It's going <laughs> to be a good 20 episodes max season. And if there's going to be a second season, it better be really fucking good. And I think that's why capping it with a triple A movie, kind of a cool idea because you can you can play with a lot more ideas that way. You know, like if they are truly connecting it to the first two, you could look at the first two as, you know, the Xenobites really just discovering humanity's realm in the cosmos, you know, and just starting to play around. And maybe it was the setup for something bigger. 
you know, like what hell on earth was eventually. Mm hmm. But maybe so maybe they're going to go in and craft it in that some type of way for the series. And then the movie is, you know, this holy war type thing, you know, where they, they you, you just have so much more room to play and so much more to build the story that way. Whereas if you do this movie first, you're going to just set the foundation up so you can't do you have to pull some punches in the movie, mm-hmm. essentially, just because of how it's created, yeah. you know, why it's created. Yeah. For sure. So I, I, don't, I just don't think it'd be a, it'd be better the other way around. So, so you, okay, so you like the movie capping it. For sure. Interesting. Yeah, I was thinking of it more of in a way as like, if the TV series is good, I don't want them to be forced to end it just so that the movie can exist. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want yeah. it to go on if it sucks, but if it's great, I don't want it to stop. You know what I mean? Like, great shows can continue and be great. Uh, Westworld uh, being a prime example that we were just talking about. Uh, another prime example, Legion. Oh my God, Legion wow. season three is so fucking Amazing. crazy. But <laughs> let, not to get off track here, uh, one final thing I want to bring up before we uh, move on to our review. Uh, one of the other writers behind this new HBO TV series, Hellraiser, he isn't known for a lot of TV or movie stuff, but he is known for writing comics and writing really good ones. He writes Predator comics. He writes Alien comics. He writes uh, Hellraiser comics, I think, now, too. I think he writes, like, a lot of really renowned horror-based comics. And you have that. Good for you him. Have, Getting you, an HBO gig. Yeah. Why he's done some TV stuff. I looked him up uh, at one point and like he had some stuff, but like he was much better known for his comic book contributions. So, so we have a picture being painted here. We have a showrunner that is saying this is based off of the original book, the original two movies and the comic books. You have Gary J. Tuncliffe saying his script was also based off of the comic books, and that it's a rumor that that script is what this TV show is going to be based on. You have writers that are known comic book artists and writers that are very respected. This is all really good news. And with that, I want to ask you, Broadcaster Nichols, do you give Clive Barker's Hellraiser, the HBO TV series, a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or a side thumb? tell you what i give it i give it not one not two not three not four no no four cotton family members <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh i i'm i'm not gonna lie i have not been more excited for a television series i think in my entire life the only thing i can even think to comprehend to compare it to is when I heard Stargate Atlantis was coming out after SG-1. But I don't think I was even close to as excited for that as I am right now for this Hellraiser TV series. There are so ma- There's so much good news. Like, everything we've heard about it is just good. Good, good, good. There's nothing bad so far. And I know it's early, but fucking A. I am super hyped for it, and I give it two enthusiastic thumbs up. And with that, we will move on to our review section. If broadcaster Nichols wills it as such man if another stargate guy got announced i I think i my faith in humanity would be restored unfortunately this timeline is too dark and we're back with our review of tetsuya nomura's ff7 remake and the creators of this video game describe it as the following The world has fallen under the control of the Shinra Electric Power Company, a shadowy corporation controlling the planet's very life force as Mako Energy. In the sprawling city of Midgar, an anti-Shinra organization calling themselves Avalanche have stepped up their resistance. Cloud Strife, a former member of Shinra's elite soldier unit, now turned mercenary, lends his aid to the group, unaware of the epic consequences that await him. Broadcaster Nichols, this is a remake of one of the greatest video games of all time that is literally 23 years in the making. This is sort of an unprecedented situation. I don't believe there has ever been a more high-profile video game remade after such a long time with such a fierce 
fan base and such like a reverence for the source material. Well, I mean, it's kind of always been generally accepted as being like the magnum opus of Final Fantasies, you mm-hmm. know. <laughs> so it's it's hard to compete with it, man. There's only a few RPGs out there that I even like put in the realm of Final Fantasy VII, you know. And it's hard to even say which one's better, you know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing I immediately noticed when I started playing this is that the graphics were good and I like them, but I noticed you said good, but they weren't knock your socks off. They were, you know what these graphics were? They were what my 20 something year old brain expected the PS three remake to look like when that was supposed to be a thing. Yep. The fact that these graphics look like what I expected the PS three version to look like means that if the PS3 version actually happened, it would have looked like total ass. For sure. It gives you a good perspective that now that you've waited this long and you got what you got in the form that it was, and it still had to be at that level graphically. You know, it just it's very telling. Mm-hmm. And this is just Midgar, too. Like, we're not even on For the sure. world map. We're just in Midgar. So it is I'm very telling. I'm so interested to see how they're going to pull that off. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, it will be interesting. It will be interesting because there, there are some changes brewing right now. So all the old Intel we have could change. And one of the old Intels we had was that no, there will not be a world map period. There will never be a world map. And that pissed off a lot of old school fans. It kind of pissed me off, but I expected it. Like, I when I first heard about this remake actually happening and when they first started releasing actual gameplay footage and it stopped being vaporware, my mind started going off and I started to think, okay, this is going to be like FF13. This is not it's going to be FF7 built into FF13. And I actually think that's exactly what we got. I think this is FF7, the Midgar section of FF7 built into a perfect version of the FF13 engine. I mean, it definitely looks like it. You you think it's actually based off of the 13 engine? Or do I, you, I do. You think I, it think, was just, I think it is. It yeah. co- coincidentally yeah. looks like it. I think they took the FF15 engine and they sort of stepped a few things back into the FF13 direction. And with the FF7 content built into it such as it is, it just totally came off as... This is the FF13 engine. When I was traveling around like all these sections of Midgar and I'm like watching these mini maps create themselves as you discover more areas of that you're you're going to go through multiple times and you look at it it just looks like an FF13 level. When I look at these maps I'm like, "Oh, this is exactly what an FF13 level looked like structurally. Like the way that the gameplay plays out looks just like FF13. The only difference is an FF13, you went into a battle sequence like FF7, like the original yes. FF7. Yes. But that battle sequence was a little bit fucked up. They fucked up a little bit with that. The, the auto battle was dumb. They really took the strategy out of it. I'm going to say the FF7 remake, the battle system, is really good. And I think it's going to probably be very unsung. I think a lot of people are going to gloss over the battle system and they're going to say, eh, I like the old one more and, uh, you know, they could have done better. I don't think they could have done better. I think that this game does present you with the best modern ATB battle system that exists. I would second that, but I would also say as a note on it that it's really the only good example we've ever seen of them attempting it. Anybody really? attempting anything. You're not lying. That's totally yeah. true. They're most so of them. God suck. knows what could really happen, you yeah. know, in the future. Maybe this, you know, shows some people that it can be done in all kinds of different ways. But I it hope is so. definitely it was very well done. It's very tasteful. I I was very skeptical even when I saw the demo or in the gameplay, you know, I was just like, I don't know, man, is that going to kill the spirit of the game? But it it, it didn't at all. It it almost like almost gave you a little bit of nostalgia when you did it because when you're paused in that freeze oh i know it's, I love it's it. just 
it's just like kind of waiting for your ga- your gauge to fill from back in the day and one of the enemies about to attack you you know but mm-hmm. instead the enemy you you paused right before an enemy attacked you or or you just dodged or whatever and you just lined up three attacks real quick exactly it's, and yeah, it, and, and it, that's it's, the key it's such too. a modern representation of that is the way you yeah. are able to line up those attacks real quick, just like Final Fantasy VII originally did. Exactly. That is the real key to this battle system that I think a lot of people are, it's going to go over their head. This is not a straight up, you get a turn. This is, you have an ATB. If you have two bars of the ATB, you don't have to do just one move. You can queue up a move after the first move that you picked. And you can switch immediately to someone else that also has ATB and chain a move with them. If you really get into this battle system and for you to do that, you have to play on normal because easy mode, I, I, for shits and giggles for science, I went on to easy mode for a little bit on a different save file just to see what it was like, because I really wanted to try classic mode. And I was really depressed when I saw that classic mode was limited to only easy difficulty. So, I, so I looked at it anyway and Oh my god, easy mode is made for like you know you know that video the the game Journo that couldn't beat the tutorial <laughs> of Cuphead. That's what easy mode is made for. It's made for those guys. This isn't easy mode. This is like a uh, graphic novel mode is what it really is. Uh so to get the actual benefit of this battle system, you have to play it on normal and once you really start to get into it, even though it's not necessary and you can really beat this game probably without going as deep as what I'm talking about, but you can do some really cool shit with this battle system. If you save up a full ATB on all three of your characters, then you chain two moves, then go immediately to the next person, chain two more moves, then go immediately to the next person, chain two more moves. You see a sequence of events that you wish you saw when you played the original FF seven It's something like out of chrono trigger when you have like the triple text and chrono trigger it's not quite like that, but it's like as close as to it as you can get. And man, I thoroughly enjoyed that depth. For sure, dude. Imagine what, you know, I, I, I don't really think this is a spoiler because it's, it's a movie he's used from the original and he was no, in and, Children and, and shit, uh, but Omni Slash, you know? Yeah. Some people might not know what that is. And I'm not going to go into depth what that is, but it's one of the coolest Limit Breaks Cloud has. And I can't imagine what that would look like in the game. Like yeah. how that's going to play out. It's going to look dope. <laughs> For sure. And uh, so, so because this game is already released originally, and this is a, a review of a remake, the non-spoiler section is going to be a little bit looser. Uh, we might talk about shit that happened in the original FF7. We will definitely not talk about anything that happens in the remake only. Anything that's remake specific, you will not hear in this section, but we may delve into some loose spoilers for the original FF7. Although I highly doubt that you haven't played that if you're listening to this right now. But I got the name right, right? It's Omni Slash? Yes, yes, Omni Slash. I think there's something close to Om- it's Omni something that was actually in the remake. I thought I, th- I thought it was yeah. Omni Slash for a second, but I was like, wait a minute. You're thinking of break. Omni Strike from Tifa. Ah, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. But uh, so, so yeah, let's, let's go into a, a little bit more of the battle system. So every single character's level one limit break from the original FF7 has instead become their permanent uh, battle ability. So every character has like this specific battle ability that they get for their first weapon. So the first each weapon one. for each character gives you the first limit break but in the form of a regular ability in the remake. So uh so so Cloud's first limit break in the original is Braver. That is the ability you get from his Buster Sword, his weapon. It's the yeah. same for uh Barrett's first weapon. I just don't remember the name of the ability, but it's the same. And uh I believe it's the same for Tifa too. I think yeah, it not, not for Aerith though. Yeah, for Aerith, yeah, I think Aerith's the only one where it's not. It's weird. It is kind of weird. Now that you say that, it stands out oddly. Yeah, so I think actually Aerith's first limit break is actually her first limit break in the remake too, right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. she's the only one like that, though. The others all got them as weapon abilities instead. So Cloud starts with a, a cross slash, his second limit break. That's his actual first limit yeah. break. Yeah, it's, it's an odd one. 
it is it is kind of odd, but I like it because I feel like it really added this cool permanent depth to the combat where you're using braver like constantly in the beginning. Like my favorite thing to do in the first five chapters was to just go around using deadly dodge materia and deadly dodging into a AOE attack, then finishing it with a, a braver. And it was just like slicing through shit early on. It was really cool. <laughs> You're going there through that like a surgeon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, boss fights. I thought that they were pretty difficult, most of them. Some of them were oddly not, like the little iRobot in uh, Hojo's lab. And uh, there's a couple others that were really easy. But most of the time, I thought they were pretty difficult, especially uh, fuck, uh, Specimen uh, Hojo's Beast, whatever. It's like Specimen H0521 or something like that. I oh, thought yeah, that yeah. he in the remake was way harder than he was in the original. And same with Rufus, too. I thought Rufus was way harder in the remake than he was in the original. And overall, I thought the difficulty was really good. When I first saw that there was only normal difficulty, I was a little worried, because I usually play games on hard. But I think that their normal mode is it's hard adjacent. It's not quite hard, but it's like good enough to where I didn't feel robbed of difficulty. Certain fights stood out, like Rufus. Mm-hmm. But I'll, I'll go into more detail about Rufus's fight later yeah. in the spoiler section because I think there were certain elements, oh yeah, about Rufus's fight that made him hard and different too. Yeah, for sure, he was probably yeah. the most unique fight in the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So you played on the dub, and I played on the original Japanese. Do you still stand by your your support for the dub after all these long hours? I mean, for the most part, I mean, there's, it's not the bet. It's not like fucking groundbreaking, but I think it's a good representation, especially because with Advent Children and, um, some of the other games like Crisis Core and Dirge of the Cerberus with Vincent, uh, Valentine, you, you've heard some of these voice actors for a while. Hmm. And, well, at least for Final Fantasy VII franchise. And yeah, I don't know. It's, it, it was pretty good. The one that really stood out that was bad, though, was Aerith. Yeah. Aerith was... I don't know if they, like, were directing her to sound fake as fuck. Or... <laughs> if that natural was just, talent. That, yeah, that was her talent or, or something. But she just... Everyone sounded pretty much, you know, genuine. Some voice actors were better than others, but Aerith. I don't know what was going on there. <laughs> Yeah, she was she was really bad. Uh, I I thought Seth Roth was almost as bad as Aerith though. Uh, so so this is what I'll say about the dub and the the original Japanese. I played the whole game in original Japanese. I played limited segments in English for science, just just to see. And the first time I turned on English with a, where Seth Roth was in it, I started laughing at how he sounds like a. T- cheesy 90s dub villain from an anime it's so bad <laughs> i can't even believe it Aerith is really bad too i think Aerith is worse than seth because at least seth Roth has like the novelty to how bad he is like it's a novel bad Aerith is just straight bad you're just a subs purist all right <laughs> you swan well, i am i am <laughs> but i acknowledge the good dubs cowboy bebop for example one of the greatest dubs <laughs> yeah, well, yeah you, everyone crutches on that one <laughs> it, it because it's the shining <laughs> diamond in the sky for dubs that's why uh i will say this though, wait a minute and- are you saying the yu yu haka show dub is not <laughs> one of the greatest series of all time anyways how on. dare you <laughs> Uh, so I will say uh, honorable mentions for the dub. I thought Cloud himself. I thought Cloud was good in the dub. Rufus, I really like in the dub. I think that Ru- I like Rufus both of his character voice actors, but I thought the dub actually outshined the Japanese for Rufus. Then Barrett, I think, was good in the dub too, uh, only because he matches the stereotypical like voice I had in my head when I played him as a kid. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, he, it's just it's, something it just that. It, it, it's uncanny how well they nailed the head and yeah. the, the, or the the voice in your head with yep. that character. Yep. You're like perfect, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> yeah, and I'll say at first I didn't like Barrett in the original Japanese, and I was like, man, I wish I could just turn his dub on but leave everyone else on OG. 
But as time went on, I actually started to really appreciate the Japanese Barrett. It's like as time went on, I started to hear him more as the dub one. You know, it's it's kind of an esoteric thing, and I don't really know how to explain it. But for some reason, like his voice just started to slip into the same like, oh, yeah, this is Barrett. This is what I imagined him as, just as a Japanese guy, right? <laughs> See, the idea of Barrett permeates through any language. It doesn't matter, man. It, it will per- it will go through like a virus. <laughs> yeah, that is for sure. I think this game respects the legacy of FF7 way more than I expected it to. My worst fear when I heard about this game is that it was just kind of going to shit on my childhood, like most remakes do. Like... Very little that comes from my past that's remade ever brings me any joy, usually brings me shame. And, man, I was surprised at the reverence of the source material that you find in this remake. It's it's much more faithful than you expect, because there was a lot of kind of back and forth about, well this is going to sort of be a deeper take into Midgar and there's going to be some stuff different and blah, blah, blah. And there was, there was some stuff different and we're going to go into all that in the spoiler section. But for the most part, it was a faithful adaptation of the original with some very key differences in certain spots. But like I said, we won't go into that yet, but what do you think about that? Did you feel the same thing I felt like as you're playing this, just be like, Oh, these guys cared about this. Like they went, you're playing through these layers. Like they cared that you were going to feel the feeling you wanted to feel when you play FS7. They wanted you to feel that and they tried really hard to make it happen. Of course. Of course. When I was in the Shinra building and you see the motorcycle that you escaped from uh, in the yeah. original. And I went up to Sergius and I saw this. I was like, man, the feels. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the feels. Yeah. 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 Yeah, man, the Shinra building was so good. But uh, were you surprised at the Materia system being the exact same? Like, I don't think they changed anything other than the summons are in their own unique Materia slot. That is literally the yeah. only thing they changed. Were you surprised by that? Well, well, yeah, I was pretty surprised that it was pretty much left intact. But the switching to the independent slot for the summons also made it so you can't stack summons anymore. Mm-hmm. Remember, like, you could have a summoner back in the original. Well, no, yeah, I always built Aerith as a summoner. <laughs> yeah, so that, that that's kind of... I, I don't know how I feel about it quite yet. I mean, I like how it just played out in this game, but when the game expands, mm-hmm. especially if they're going to do more of an open world thing, I'm hoping they might tweak the system a little bit to change that. You know, or maybe give you the ability to hold more summons. It's still a different independent materia system, yeah. but they allow you to expand right. it at least. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm thinking it's going to be like Mega Man X style. You get like a fucking yeah. capsule, and all of a sudden you have a second summon slot. Yeah, some E-Tanks, bro. Yeah, that's some E-Tanks. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so, so uh, most of the music... <sighs> I know there's a few new songs, but almost all of it is original music, but some of it is remixed. And uh, not always in a good way. Uh, What do you think overall about the music? Because if I'm really going to categorize my thoughts on this game and like what I don't like and what I do like, the music honestly permeates more towards the don't like with what they did with it. Where, Where are you at on the music overall? Nothing specific, but just overall. You know, in the beginning... I I liked it. I was like, all right, all right, I, this is this is popping. All right, this is cool. I like it. And then after a while, it's just like, ah, yikes! I can't fucking I can't stand this beat anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so basically, I think we're both on board. Where the if we started off saying what we were worried about before knowing anything, I think the music would probably have been like at the very very bottom of both of our lists. But unfortunately, in the reality of the game's release, it ends up kind of being towards the top, probably on both our lists. I'm, I'm going to extrapolate from that response. For sure. Yeah. And it's probably one of the most lackluster parts of the game. I agree. I'd and say. then and there's the, a couple hitters. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying oh, yeah. to let down any of the people mm-hmm. who worked on the soundtrack because there's some hitters. Oh, there is. As far for as sure. We're talking about original content. We're talking there's overall. The, yeah, there's a lot of the original soundtrack in there, too. Yeah. But the new sound our tracks. 
it's mm. just like they, they were good, but it's just like some of them were good. You don't really belong. Yeah, a couple of them <laughs> I have some choice words about, but we'll leave that for later. Yeah. Uh, let's go into another disappointment. There's no victory fanfare. There is no pose. Uh, you do not see Cloud twirl his sword in the air and dun, 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 dun. No, you don't get any of that, except for in the Coliseum. Yep. I found that to be extremely disappointing. You don't have to make it super long. There are no load times. You're, the game exists in itself. You don't go to a different sequence for a battle. You're in the same place you were before. So what the hell is the harm in having Cloud do a quick two-second sword twirl and do the little hum and you're over? But they don't. Yeah. But what they I replace would... it with is Barrett randomly humming the theme <laughs> song in the most obnoxious, just... insul- insulting, pointless way possible. And it, it that's almost one seemed of my... like a troll. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my sticking points with the game. It really pissed me off. Whenever fucking Barrett would hum, the... it's just like rubbing salt in a wound. Well, it makes me think that the creators, the developers, didn't think too highly of that to begin with Mm -hmm. they always found it to be cheesy and that's why they took it out and didn't really think about how much it meant to some people i get what they were thinking the battles aren't separate they exist in the world so it doesn't make sense to do it the same way yeah i get it but you could have done it and shortened it you Mm -hmm. could have made cloud do a quick twirl that's it don't have to do the rest that's still would have been much better than the just nothing that they gave us. And that would have been, been like been really cool Four if seconds. he actually did it. <laughs> if he actually did it, but you could interrupt it and just move on. And he's like, okay, fine, whatever. Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> Let people skip it. If they move, it stops. There you go. If you, if you move, it stops and it's over. Or you can sit there and you can have your little nostalgia cake. I just don't see why you go through such pains to keep the reverence so high for the source material, you stick so close to a lot of stuff, and you do so well on most of it, and then there's a little tiny thing that's so key, you're just like, nah, fuck that. I just don't get it. Well, you heard it here, folks. Two-Spirited Penguin is very, very disappointed <laughs> with the lack of well, outro. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. That's my biggest gripe with the game. So, I will say that uh, the FF7 remake is just Midgur, and it doesn't go quite as deep into Midgur as you would think based off of the developer comments sort of being like, oh, this is like, we're just going to go super deep into Midgur and we're really going to blow this shit up. And I I heard talk of like 60 hours of gameplay at one point. That's not the case here. Uh, Broadcaster Nichols beat it in 35 hours, and I beat it in 45 hours. I'm not really quite sure the derivation on why we were so different, but either way, we both Absolute did... Absolute savage speaking here. We we both did all the side content. Uh, so, like, these are concrete numbers. Uh, if, if you just do all the side content and you beat the game once, you're going to get anywhere from 35 to 45 hours out of this. You're not going to get 60. But there is a shit ton. You will if you play hard mode. Right, that's what I was going to get to. Easily, you could get more. There is a shit ton of content that you get a kind of redo on hard mode in a kind of a very specific way that is unique to this game. I haven't done any of that yet. Uh, We are strictly reviewing the normal first playthrough experience. Uh, But I will just say, don't expect to come into this and get like a 100-hour RPG. This is not a 100-hour RPG. This is much more modest. This is... Like I said, 35 to 45 hours, but I think that out of those hours, most of them are very good, and uh, I highly recommend that you play it if you're an FF7 fan, and if you're not an FF7 fan, I really have no idea why you're even listening to this, and I should say just go play FF7 anyway, so either way, same answer. Go play it, uh, and with that, let's go to our spoiler section. (laughs) Warning, warning, warning. What a twist. What a twist. Holy shit. Square lied to you. Square yes, <laughs> Square fucking put a mask on you and made you thought your name was Daughtry and that you this were a is... fucking guitarist and the traveling Wilburys. But really, you were Static X. You were Wayne Static the whole time. Dude, we got That's Honey Dick. We did we get did. Honey Dick. We, we got did. Honey Dick. We did. So, so spoiler alert. 
uh, this game takes place in a fucking alternate dimension. This is not well. We a we don't know what it is, but yeah, go on. <laughs> so, okay, strongly implicated that we yeah. are now in an alternate dimension from the original FF Seven. So every single thing that actually happened in FF Seven that you remember is not this game. It is an alternate reality in which events go down differently for reasons we don't know yet. They don't really explain to you why all of a sudden these whispers appear and that you are able to change fate and go into this alternate reality, but that's how the game ends. This game is basically a faithful adaptation all the way to the last level to the point where you're fighting Rufus on the tower the same way you go into the motorcycle, you escape the same way with the same goddamn little truck that you're defending, all the way to the point where you enter a fucking alternate dimension, start finding interdimensional demon monsters in the sky. Yeah. Uh, whoa. Yeah. It went from zero to fucking 200,000 200, right at chapter 18. <laughs> like when oh chapter 18 it's, it's like oh okay it's like the villain releasing his master plan on you like at the perfect timing you're like damn he did it how yeah. the fuck did you get this past me <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's 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 shadow play this is total shadow play because square was very careful in what they said about this game to not give this away and to basically not tell you that this is a stealth reboot the events that happen at the end of this game essentially reboot the entire rest of the game everything after midgar is set up to be completely different now from the original what does that mean that means advent children erased dirge of cerebrus erased Aerith will probably not die now which is one of the biggest twists of the original uh zach might not be cloud anymore that was one of the biggest twists of the original we don't know the one thing that i found very interesting though is that they featured zach in this game quite a bit more than yep. i expected and to me yeah. that means that zach is going to be much more involved in the actual game in the future well, There's going to be an alternate Zack in this new reality that the FF7 remake takes place in that's going to be totally different from the old Zack that we saw in the original FF7, but you never really interacted with. Like, he was always just like this background character that existed in a previous time that you were just looking at backstory for. Yeah. Well, some some people are, are uh, kind of going back and forth on whether what, what you were seeing with Zack Fair was in the same timeline or not like if that was his like if that was the original timeline see we we can go into this a little bit more further on but i think it advent children and dirge of cerebrus aren't exactly erased i think everything is starting to like i said in the original the preview podcast i think they are they found some weird way to meld everything together and mm. Zach fair being in the game mm. as much as he was, especially with his demise being in the game so much, which is in the crisis court game. It makes me really think that. Yeah. But speaking of confirmed preview predictions uh, in our FF seven remake preview way back in November, I brought up the fact that what if Aerith doesn't die? What if they just throw us a curveball and Tiff a, dies in her place barrett yeah. already died kind of you know in in her place in a way it's kind of weird how they pulled that off i'm like so how many other people are going to get the fucking axe and get revived <laughs> yeah you know what the other weird thing was is they paid real true tribute to the zip line uh cgi scene going across midgar mm -hmm. sector while the plate was falling yeah. right. and it showed uh sith <laughs> kate sith yeah well, it showed him without the the Shinra machine. It was just the cat. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. It, I was just like, oh, shit, it's going to be in the game. Never nope. seen. It was literally <laughs> just in a fucking movie clip. What yeah. the fuck? <laughs> yeah, and then you get Red 13, and he comes at the, you know, the exact time that he should, but he's not playable. He's like this helper character. But yeah. here's the thing. I observed him in the fights that he was he's in. He's a, a fully helper. playable character. He he is, 
for sure. And I don't understand why they decided to hold that back. Like why they decide we're not going to let people control him. What do you think? I think, do you think that be- is a preview of future chapters. Do you think they're going to add like a helper class? Because uh, another yes. great RPG that has come out recently is called Persona 5. And in Persona 5, there are a specific type of character that are like an overlord support class that you don't actually use in combat, but they're kind of just there helping you, giving you buffs and doing stuff. I have a feeling that that's what Red 13 is and that Kate Sith might be the exact same type of character and that we're going to have Yuffie. (laughs) I hope not Yuffie. Yuffie's got to be. I would hope not. Uh, But If they do that to Yuffie, I'm going to be pissed, but maybe. Either way, I have a feeling that this was a precursor and this was not like a glaring omission. Like everyone's like, Oh, you just wanted to get lazy and not put the program. No, the programming's in there. I could tell you could have played red 13. They did not want you to. He's probably, you know, we talked about this earlier, but I think what most likely happened was, and this is kind of a showcase of where they were at with the product they had, you know, is they had a clear spot where they wanted the first installment to end. And that just unfortunately coincided with red 13's introduction. You know, it just barely gave them enough room in the game and they didn't want to change the game dramatically enough. Or they couldn't come up with a good enough reason to not have, you know, red 13, at least in the story there, you know? So instead of that, they went half in, they baked a half cake. They made a character that they're definitely going to use in the next installment, but he wasn't quite fleshed out as much as the other characters, which means that they would have implemented him as a character in the game to use. People would have been disappointed or they perceived that people would have been disappointed. So they just didn't do it. That's what I think happened. But if it really has good, uh, you know, if people end up liking it, because I, I wasn't a big, it sounds like both of us weren't a very big fan of it. But if people are okay with it, I could totally see them doing that in the next installment, going, getting away with that. You know, it would just, it would be just a fucking shame to see like characters like Sid, you know, as just a support character. That'd be fine. Like what? No. Yeah, and, and Sid is a prime example of one that would go into that role too. Yeah, it, it, it is. I'm really wondering about that now because it reeks of shadow play, like. I feel like they might be doing that with just the overall arc of some of the characters. I think that we saw very clearly in this remake that Barrett, Tifa, and Aerith are the main characters. Like All we, of that installment. We, I don't think it's of that installment. I think that when we get Vincent, when we get Yuffie, when we get Sid, when we get Kate Sith, we, I don't believe that they're going to be even close to as much backstory, as much dialogue as what we got from Barrett, Tifa, and Aerith. I think that they have clearly decided we are. Well, they going never to did. Focus. Let's be, in. let's be honest. They never did. I mean, if we're truly, if you go back to the game, they were the main characters. They were a part of all of them. Even if you weren't using them in your party, they right. appeared in the main key story elements of the game. So it was always. That was always the direction, right? It's that true. was always kind of what they were doing. It's true, but they added a shit ton of extra dialogue for all of those characters in this remake. If you yeah. compare their dialogue to the original, to this remake, it's got to be four times more for every single character. And then Cloud, ten times more? I mean, Cloud was... Uh, yeah, the- well, he was the silent protagonist big time back in the, in the original, so... Oh, dude. This is crazy to see him talk as much. And he also had some jokes. That was the weirdest thing. They did it tastefully. (laughs) They did it tastefully. All right. It wasn't like he was some flamboyant jokester or something like that. But the jokes he did have, I'm like, damn, Cloud got jokes. For sure. (laughs) Cloud is basically a new character in this game. In FF7, he was just this strong, silent type that basically never talked. And like everything you kind of got from him was just inferred. And in Remake, he's just, like, this smart-ass operator guy. Like, he's got jokes, he's talking all the time, he's short with people, sure, and I like, I'm glad that they kind of kept an element of Cloud's personality in there, but, dude, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say he had ten times more dialogue in the remake than he did in the original of Midgar. Well, no doubt. And I think Advent Children changed that. It did. You know, Advent Children, yeah, yeah, it invented a speaking role for... um, for cloud 
So I think everyone wasn't willing to take a step back from it at that point. <laughs> it's an man. interesting one, man. This it is it's just so weird how much changed in one chapter. And I got a crackpot theory that I'm gonna I'm gonna lay on the listeners at the end of this podcast. Oh, at the I, end. Oh, there's a tease. I, man, there there's some key differences here. Uh Sethroth comes off way different in this game. Uh again, sort of like Cloud. So the the way that Cloud changed, it's almost mirrored by Sethroth a little bit. He comes off much more like a Magus from Chrono Trigger than he does the original Sethroth from the original FF7, where he was much more kind of straightforward and sinister. He was the final boss. The the entire game revolved around him. Yeah, Midgur did sure. not revolve around Sethroth. No, though. And no doubt, in, no in doubt. the remake, it does revolve around him, but in a way that's much different. Uh, at the end of this game, there's a cutscene where Sethroth like reaches his hand out and he's like, "Join me, and we will fucking save the cosmos or whatever." And like this weird, stunning moment of like, is up really down, and is down really up? <laughs> and of course, Cloud turns him down like he would in the original. But just the fact that Sethroth does this gives me a major hint that he is not the same Sethroth. I do not believe we are dealing with the same Sethroth we did in the FF7 original. I think it's an entirely different version of Sethroth. And I find sure. we might actually find out that he's actually the original Sethroth that died in the original FF7 or was beaten by Cloud with the Omni Slash at the end, but he somehow traveled into a different dimension with the power of Genova or some shit and was given another chance, blah, 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 whatever, something like that. And that well, he damn is it. actually the That's original. That's my crackpot theory. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> well, my my idea was a little bit different in the fact that he just manipulates, the t he just goes in the time stream, finds out how to like rewind. <laughs> and he just like goes back in that, to that time and he's fucking with the time stream. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, no that, doubt. I, I, I totally, I totally believe it because there's just too much. There's too much different about Sethroth. His attitude, his demeanor, his tone. With it's like he knows saying. what happened. It's he like does. he knows he's lost already he, before. He, exactly, <laughs> dude. And the way he treats Cloud is with this respect. It yep, is not sure. earned yet. Cloud has not earned the respect yet that Sethroth is giving him. Another clear indication that he knows. So. It's either the same Sethroth or it's Sethroth somehow got memories from the past and it's not really the same Sethroth, but he just remembers what that Sethroth remembered. Either way, this is not the same Sethroth. I believe that this is going to be a Magus situation. And instead of Sethroth being the last boss of FF7 Remake, he's going to join you as a playable character at the very end if you decide to give him redemption on the, you know, the cliffside. And he's like... I, I know, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay, you can join a Sethroth. And he's going to join you to go fight the final boss, oh, the dude, Lavos. That would be... And who will dude. the Lavos be? It'll be Genova, right? So if this happens, like we're that talking so about, Genova <laughs> is going to be the final boss. And I have a feeling that this Genova is not going to be your grandpappy's Genova. <laughs> but, you know, it, it let, the things in the game definitely lead, lead credence, lend credence to the time travel idea. That's why Zach's alive. You know, that's why there's some new characters in the game that are in places where they never were before. Uh, you know, there's there's just some things that you just can't explain away. It's just like, well, what the is this a reboot or you're going to explain to me why this person is here in this scene that was definitely in the original, but he wasn't. <laughs> and they did that at the very last chapter. And I, I mean, we've said it a few times. I just got to give Square credit. They did something that no, very few modern video game companies are capable of. They kept a secret. There were no leaks. There was no uh, hints. It was just like, you think you're playing a remake of FF7 that just goes a little deeper into it. You go all the way through it. And then at the very end, as it goes, we get to the upside down castle that you never saw coming. And that was only possible because Square could keep a secret and they could keep their devs in line, but don't give any bullshit hints and people are going to start figuring the shit out. And no one knew. I don't believe anyone knew that this was coming. Oh no, for sure. There's no doubt about it. I mean, like you said earlier, <laughs> they did a really good job 
in the marketing department to sell this as a remake. Mm-hmm. You know, not a reboot. <laughs> yeah. And that is definitely what it ended up being. Indeed. <laughs> I, dude. You can't cut it any other way. I'm not even convinced that part two is going to start in calm anymore. I don't even. Well, like, everything's upside it? down now. <laughs> Remember that interview, Toriyama said some some things that are pretty relevant to that thought of yours. And, <laughs> where he was just like, you know, it's been so long, I can't quite remember how they got to Calm. Hmm. Well, maybe Calm isn't there anymore. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a genius move. It, the, the fact that they kept it a secret made it powerful and gave it a punch. And then the aftermath of it is, oh, we're no longer just waiting for a... a basically a really good remaster of ff7 we are now sort of getting an alternate timeline of ff7 that you don't know what's going to happen you know it makes me uh reluctantly optimistic i mean there's definitely some things in the game that i don't quite agree with certain people getting revived or getting killed off to begin with i was just like you guys just did that to waste time you just did it to fill up like this short little chapter you gave us in Midgar. I, feel, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is there's a lot of fluff. And when you really look at the game mm. in hindsight, there's some fluff. There's a good amount of fluff in there that it just, it's like, why did it did you, like Corneo's little or Corneo's a uh, uh, lackey. What is it? I, I think, yeah. What's his Leslie, name? Leslie, Le- Kyle. Leslie. Yeah. Leslie. I hated that character so much. Why? What was that even a thing? Like, I thought he was going to almost become a character. I was like, are we mm-hmm. going to get a new character here or something like that? And then it just ended up being nothing. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was really weird. And you're right. Like the thing I'll say about this game is what they took from the original and redid was all masterful, but yeah, the new sure. stuff they put in, and this includes, <sighs> This includes Leslie Kyle. This includes Chadley. This includes the bizarre side quest that, like, we talked off air at one point, and you said it's a bunch of GTA NPCs. That's so true. That's exactly what it is. It's like fucking generic Grand Theft Auto NPCs that you're getting these quests from. And it's just like, even in Japanese, the dialogue's cringy. Like, usually, because we're English speakers, and we hear Japanese as sort of a, an exotic foreign language, even though we've been watching subbed anime for fucking ever. But it, nonetheless, it kind of hides some of the flaws. Like, a, a native Japanese speaker is going to hear more flaws in these voice acting performances than we're going to. Even as my gaijin Weebu self, I could hear some of these dialogues with these side quest NPC Japan Japanese, and it's just like, oh, this is bullshit. These yeah, this it's phoned is, in, dude. <laughs> oh, it's it's not good. And you can just kind of feel that they spent a lot of time on the main stuff. And when they got to the stuff that's new, instead of really like buckling down and kind of digging into it like you kind of expected based off interviews. They kind of sent in their C team, like, just take care of it, make some fetch quests, whatever. Yeah, it's probably it was the most glaring thing that stood out to me that mm. disappointed. It almost ruined the game to me. When I first started playing the game, before, you know, you really started to absorb some of the more classic content that was done beautifully, it almost ruined it for me. I'm just like, oh, my God, is this what yeah. all the side quests are going to be? And that is how it was, unfortunately. But the game, it, it did enough right to just you not give a fuck about that shit but mm-hmm. it still was there and i hope they were that's something they really polish in the next installment that's needs to be redone it, there wasn't too much of it in the midgar in the first disc but the game the w summon knights of the round all that stuff mm-hmm. you didn't have to go get it it didn't really tell you how to go get it either you had to talk to to people and figure mm-hmm. out that the, there's these things in the world around, unless you went and cheated and just went on the internet. But there wasn't a lot of that back in the day. So it, I was really hoping for some of that, and I didn't get any of that in the room. No, room. no. Instead, so you, you, that's inst- unfortunate. Yeah, instead you got Leslie Kyle, who was like this little simp beta bitch who made no sense as a character. Like, he acts all hard in the beginning, sitting at the door like, you don't want to come in, fuck with Don Corneo. Fuck you, dude. Get out of here, guy. Like, he's all acting hard and shit. And then, like, randomly a few chapters later, 
he's like, I'm going to help you guys out. And you're like, what? I thought you like hated us and we're Don Corneo's dude. He's like, nah, nah, I want revenge. And you're like, okay. And you go along and he eventually he tells you a story about how he gave his girlfriend to Don Corneo and then Don Corneo <laughs> sent, <laughs> sent her down into the sewer for her death. And I'm just like, well, wait a second. The key term here is you gave him the girlfriend. Like he admits in this dialogue that he willingly gave Corneo his girlfriend. I'm just like, bro, Sapuku time you are yeah. the one you begin revenge against yourself bruh <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i thought the exact same thing i was like dude i don't want to hear about this shit you're a terrible person i don't want to help you <laughs> oh man so let me get this straight you sold your girlfriend to a kingpin <laughs> who then raped her and then fed her to a monster in the sewer and now you want me to help you in this redemption arc <laughs> no there's no redemption for you bro <laughs> yeah that's the only thing that could have saved that whole like side story is if it like at the end of it cloud's just like uh you're wrong you're the bad guy and he just like sliced him in half that would have been cool but <laughs> unfortunately that does not happen and is a grindhouse presents final <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 but uh yeah so i think we agree like the the side quests and like the new sort of characters they shoehorn in not the best chadley is another one that we're going to talk about basically in this game so in the original ff7 you did not get as much materia and abilities as you do in this one because this is supposed to be one game instead of one fourth of a game like it was in the original so in the original you have like you're just getting fire at the end of midgar you're you are not fully loaded with fire aga all these fucking materia manipulation uh you can shit. get five you can get level threes of course you can get anything in old school rpgs because you can grind if you want i'm talking if you just play normally you're, oh, you're gosh, dude i had fire aga in chapter four yeah, dude, I had fire. Oh, I, get you. The I misunderstood the what you were saying. Yeah, dude, <laughs> like, dude, there is a certain point where I'm just like, I, I, I had Cloud set up as a mage. I had the fucking mage sword. I had Fire Aga with the one that does the AOE uh, manipulation materia. I was going through this part of the game early on where it's just like enter battle. Fire Aga W cast. <laughs> yeah. Everyone dies instantly. Battle over. That went on like. I start. I stopped doing it because I got bored, and I just started fucking around with other shit, and it made the game more fun. Because I'm just like, dude, there ain't. First of all, almost every mob in Midgar is fucking weak to fire. <laughs> there's, there's just some weird stuff. Like, what's that character's name? Roche. I forget, we yeah. should have talked about him earlier when we were talking about things that changed. Well, He's just like, what the hell? That thing, it, yeah. it didn't went. It didn't go anywhere. <laughs> they were yeah. like, I got excited for a second. I was like, oh, dude. A yeah. soldier. You never saw any other soldiers in the first game yeah. <laughs> in the original. So I was like, sweet, they're gonna do some some Crisis Core, Flash, uh, Loveless, and all those other ones. But nonetheless, when I saw him, I immediately thought he was he was like a gang. He was one of the members of that type of gang, you know, of the higher up soldiers. Yeah, and then it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> no, it didn't. And uh, circling back to Chadley, so. Uh, I bring up the materia situation because this game was not designed to have the amount of materia that's in Midgar that they put in the remake. You just didn't have as much. You, by the time I beat this game, I had so much materia in my inventory. I could not believe it. And yeah. what this Chadley character is, is he's a Shinra intern that somehow finds you at the very beginning of the game. Like, like he's a stalker and he's like hey dude uh give me battle intel and i'll give you materia cool right okay and so you do these things it's like battle logs from ff14 where you do specific things in combat you get intel on these enemies and you report back to chadley and then he gives you discounted new materia that you find that you buy the first one super cheap then you can buy more for more expensive the only way you can get these materials from him I don't like Chadley as a character. I think he's a little douchebag. I don't think he should be in the game. I think he makes no sense as a character, and he's totally shoehorned in. And I think all the materia that he had, it should have just been hidden throughout Midgar. There were so many empty spots in this Midgar that you could have stuck materia in. 
there's so many, because the way I play RPGs is I look at every corner. If I know the right way to go, I purposely go every wrong way to go before I go the right way. That's how I play RPGs. And I saw... I saw so many spots that were perfect to hide a material or something. Nothing there. Just nothing. It's just empty. Well, they did it for the Sector 5 uh, sabotage mission. Yeah, they did. They For the Chocobo yep. uh, mod. That was the only time they did it. In, in it's so that, weird. I saw that. I was like, all right, that's a good example right yep. there. That's it. And that's what I wanted the whole game to be like. Like that was one of my favorite parts. When I saw that, I was like, yes, this is what I want. I want there to be materia that you can see, but you can't get to because it's a puzzle and you have to figure out how to fucking get to that materia. It was perfect. And I thought the whole rest of the game was going to be like that. No, you had to fucking deal with Chadley's bitch ass making you do VR missions to get Shiva. And yeah, I just but didn't, I did didn't you like even that. get, I, I don't, I think you got Ifrit, but you yeah. didn't get Shiva in the first disc. Did you? No, that was you in didn't. the second disc. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you did not get Shiva till the second disc. Nor did you Obviously. get Leviathan or any of those motherfuckers. Le- Leviathan, <laughs> yeah, Leviathan was definitely disc two. Bahamut was disc two. Uh I'm the baby baby Chocobo's new. It's not even real from the yeah. original, so that doesn't matter. Carbuncle. Yeah. So Which is one of my main fucking gripes of this whole deal. <laughs> so, How are you so gonna yeah. give me it's that limited of summons, right? And you're going to make them one so exclusive. <laughs> Bullshit. Yeah, I agree. I, I think they could have done Materia better. I'm glad they kept the Materia system ma- mostly the same, but I'm I'm not happy with Chadley. And it's just kind of a theme with the new stuff. I'm not really happy with the new stuff they did. I like everything that they did that was old, that they redid. I think they did an amazing job on all of it, but they just did not. I don't know. Was their heart not in it? Or is it just that, like, when you add new stuff to an old thing, it just gives you this weird esoteric feeling of, like, discombobulation that you can't shake? I don't know what it is. I just oh, I did think not it, like it. I, I think it was very purposeful because they made uh, – they took a section of a game and expanded it into a, a full-fledged game in size. But there's just a lot of elements – that are in parts of the game that they are not remaking that people are going to want to see. And if they don't see them, then it's just not going to have the right feels, you know, that's why you get effort in Shiva and all those are Shiva and Leviathan and Bahamut and stuff like that. Even though it makes you OP. (laughs) Oh, it does. I dude, I felt so OP going through this game. It's amazing. Like I, and this is coming from someone that definitely wiped on most of the bosses multiple times. Like the, the hard ones, especially like I want to say sure. I, I wiped on Airbuster probably three times. I wiped on specimen H O two five one, at least five times. There are several bosses, uh, even hell house. I wiped a few times on like, there's several bosses that I wiped on many times. I sadly didn't wipe on any of the final bosses. I was astonished. I, I just, I destroyed all the way up to like the three individuals to in the dragon and then ultimately or well Genova the the three individuals then the dragon and then Sethroth I didn't die once I was astonished this yeah. is so weird like how is that possible but okay you say that but you definitely wiped on Rufus right no are no, you I did fucking not wipe kidding on Rufus. me no I I, okay. I guess we, it's a good point that you brought that up because that so it was difficult, me. but I I healed my way all the way through it. Like once I got the trick, I was like, oh, I know how to get you, motherfucker. All I have to do is go into aggressive mode, deflect your attack and then get my damage in and just do that over and over and over again. I I don't know, man. I found Rufus to be the shining example of the difficulty in the FF7 remake because First of all, I think Rufus is one of the best fights in the game. He has three phases. Uh, Phase one is a joke. (laughs) A total joke. Yeah, it was pretty a joke. Phase two. The dog. It's just just, just killing the dog. Yeah, it is. Phase two, on the other hand, I think is one of the hardest bits of the entire game. In phase two, yeah, he starts throwing the coins up and doing his special moves. The problem with him is in phase two is that he puts crazy pressure on you. Like 
any time that I would try and come up to him to attack, he was there before me fucking kicking my face in. Any time he'd react to everything I did and just fucking kick my face in. And it was doable. I mean, the very first time I wiped on him, I think I almost had him to phase three before I wiped. But there's just like this element to Rufus phase two that it was unforgiving and very extreme. And I think that you got lucky and you beat him like when you beat him the first time. No, because because I almost beat him the first time, too. But then I didn't. And then I wiped like six more times after that. But I almost beat phase two the very first time. I oddly wiped multiple times on odd, like, uh, God, what's his name? Uh, not Reno. What's the other guy's name? Oh, Rude? Rude. I wiped on Rude twice, and I couldn't believe it. I was like, what the fuck? Rude's a joke in this game. In the original. Yeah. What's going on here? <laughs> yeah. No, Rude, Rude was actually pretty difficult. I'll agree with you there. I think Reno, Reno was easy. I never wiped on Reno. Uh, I definitely wiped on Rude. Maybe two times, not too many, but I definitely wiped on him a few times. And then surprisingly, when you fight Reno and Rude together on top of the tower, one shot it. And I expected that to be the hard one. So there is definitely some variance to the boss fights. Not all of them are super hard hitters, but there's enough of them that are that even on normal mode that you feel like you get your difficulty out. To me, anyway. And Rufus, I just thought that Rufus was like Square kind of giving you a preview of what's to come. Like, we're going to have multiple phase fights. Some phases are going to be easy, but then you're going to be smacked in the face with a hard one. And this is going to be like an MMORPG. And that's oh, sort sure. of that's just sort of the overall vibe I got from this entire game is they're setting you up to like, listen... This is FF7, but you better tackle these bosses more like their MMORPG bosses than just like a turn-based original FF7 boss because you got to well, dodge. That's pretty some much shit. how the combat's set up more. Yeah. Besides the fact that you're just not mashing, you know, buttons to mm-hmm. shoot skills or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting you say that because it, it the Rufus fight was it, it stands out is the most creative and the coolest example mm-hmm. out of all the fights done because he did have three phases and even though the first phase was kind of a joke all it needed to be is more difficult mm-hmm. that's kind of the problem with a lot of things but a lot yeah. of the fights in the game to be in, to be honest but i don't think it the three phases in themselves were lacking in creativity i thought it was cool they started you off mild it's just attack his dog and it was almost paying again homage to the original fight with rufus where he starts off with his dog and himself and you take out the it well it's strategical to take out the dog first, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like, oh, so now the fa- the first phase of the remake, you're actually just trying to attack the dog and kill him. And then you you engage in the second phase. Yeah. Towards yeah, the good. end, uh, I was surprised that uh, I one-shot Sethroth, the final boss. Like That was <laughs> That crazy. was the most surprising to me because I wiped on uh, Whispers. I mean, whatever you want to call it. I, I was calling it Whisper Bahamut, but it's technically just like this group of whisper demons, super demons that you fight in that nether realm, alternate dimension thing. I wiped on that three times and I got to Seth Roth finally. And I'm just like, okay, I'm prepared. I'm going to wipe on this a bit. I got some time set aside. Let's do this. Fucking one shot his ass game over. I'm just like, whoa, that's interesting. Like you, <laughs> you made a concerted effort to make this boss right before Seth Roth much harder than Sethroth himself when you're dude, they played up the Sethroth fight so much. They gave him his one wing. Yep. Like you gave him, you made him <laughs> the one wing angel in the fucking Midgar section of the remake, but he's a pushover that I found that to be very bizarre. It was really weird. It was like getting hit with a pillow that looks really <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I will say about the Sethroth fight structurally, I fucking loved it and i think it's one of the best designed fights in the entire game it was just too easy i love the way you start off with sethroff as a duel with cloud because it reminded me of the very end of ff7 original where we we're talking about the omni slash to finish him off that's how that's basically how the fight starts in remake it's yep. just cloud versus sethroff and i'm just sitting there like oh is he just gonna omni slash him and it's game over like are we even gonna have a fight here 
honestly, half of that fight scene between him and Sethroth was taken straight out of Advent Children. It was, yeah. If you look, if you look at the fight scene between him and Sethroth and Advent Children, some scenes were taken almost straight scene for scene. <laughs> There's a lot of Advent Children in this game. Yeah. Like in a meta level, not in a story level, but in just like a meta level, especially with Seth Roth and Cloud and their interactions. It would have been really cool. I was at the beginning when the, um, they only gave you the, the buster sword mm-hmm. and you hadn't got another weapon yet. And I was I was like, dude, I wonder if they're going to do like the Advent Children type thing where instead of getting like weapons now you just get it upgraded and it turns into different types of weapons and you can then eventually get it fully upgraded and then you un- unlock omni slash because you have all the swords that can bust out of the weapon <laughs> <laughs> i thought that's how they were really going to do it no nope. they stayed really true and i mean like really true to the weapon palette <laughs> yeah they- it was i don't think they varied at all i mean there was there, obviously some weapons weren't there but all the ones that were there were originals, especially Barrett. It was really cool seeing Barrett's weapons actually fleshed out because you didn't really get to see the difference in his weapons in, in the original, mm-hmm. not as much as like cloud. So it was really cool to see like when you changed it to big Bertha, you actually finally got to see what big Bertha looked like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I up, thought they up, did up. a great job with the weapons, honestly, because I mean, in combat, obviously, if I remembered correctly, it did change. Like they did try to change a little bit of his hand, but obviously they were blocks. So there wasn't a lot changing. If I remember correctly, did they, or was it just cloud that had the, the change of weapons cosmetically? Uh, n- no, they definitely okay. all, yeah, all their weapons definitely changed, but okay. I, there, I remember there was some characters where you couldn't really, maybe it was red 13. I don't know. There, I remember that there were some characters that you really couldn't see a difference, but then like the ones with actual weapons like cloud and Barrett and even Tifa, I think I remember seeing different gloves on Tifa. If I'm not Tifa's totally was mistaken. probably the most unnoticeable though. I mean, how probably you but notice gloves on a block hand. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the ones you noticed were like cloud and Yuffie and Vincent, like the ones that have like actual tangible weapons they're carrying. Yeah. I feel like with Kate Sith and with red 13, uh, quote unquote, the support characters in our crack seller theory didn't seem like their weapons really ever changed no matter what you gave them. Unless I'm tripping. and I just don't remember correctly. I don't think they did. Yeah. So do you think Wu Tai is going to play a bigger role in like the overall uh, future of the remake? Because most of the time in this first chapter, you sp- every word you hear from Shinra is basically them trying to propagandize uh, yeah. Wu Tai as like the enemy of the people. Like they. they they are our enemy. They're blowing up your power supply. They're trying to ruin your lives. It's all Wu Tai's fault. And it, it totally reminded me of like weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> oh, for sure. With George W. Bush. I just kept thinking of like, was this directly inspired by the yellow cake? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was actually surprised when we didn't see Wu Tai pretty much the whole game. I was like, huh. Well. Yeah, I kind of expected like them to actually launch an attack and like you know, this is a good time to go back to uh <clears throat> Roche. So it is I was four, just about to say that. Yeah. Chapter 4 is totally new. So most of this game is basically the same. It's mostly a faithful adaptation except for the final chapter and for chapter 4. Chapter 4 is entirely new. It features the the Avalanche B team. It's all about Jesse, Biggs, and Wedge, mainly Jesse. Uh, you just do this kind of absurd little thing where you're like, oh, my bomb was too powerful. I want to get a weaker bomb. And you like go and like steal some stuff from Jesse's mom. And it's just like, it was super contrived. And again, like that's like my theme really with this review is that the well, it's a hybrid that, of something that originally happened. Right? Yeah, yeah. The stuff yeah. that originally happened, I feel like it was all great in the remake, but like the stuff that they reached out on and tried to like be new on, I really didn't like it, except for Roche. And when I first saw the motorcycle mini game early, when you're doing it with Roche in the beginning of the game in Chapter Four, I was like, "Oh shit, Upside Down Castle is here already." 
I thought the yep. upside down castle appeared in chapter four. It it doesn't actually appear till the end of the game, but I thought it did in chapter four because of this. You fight a soldier, third class named Roche. He's really cool. He's like trying to compete with Cloud, and it, it, like he has no like you can just tell he has no malice towards Cloud. Doesn't want to kill Cloud. He wants to play with Cloud. This is like he just wants to have a playmate, <laughs> and and uh, the way they frame it is like. We're we're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. Like, this is all going to be different from now on. However, after you finish Chapter 4, it all goes back to normal, and Roche disappears for the entire rest of the game. Do you think that this was done on purpose to set up Roche for the rest of the game? Do you think Roche will be back? Uh, Yeah, he definitely will be. I think they're going to lean into the more, like, soldiers, especially now that Zack's alive. I think they're going to I think the whole soldier project is going to be leaned into more. But the, the, you know back to the Wu Tai comment. I thought at in chapter 4 uh chapter 4 is when he comes in for the second time, right? And rescues everybody. That's what we're talking about, right? He like everyone's surrounded and he comes in with the bike. Mhm. Yeah. Right. That's well, the, yeah, that's the it second starts, and last time you see him. Well, no, no, no. Chapter four starts with the motorcycle thing with him and Cloud. And then it yeah. ends with him saving Cloud from that uh, operation he's doing with the Avalanche B team. Okay. Got it. Got it. That's yeah. what it is. Um, so <laughs> when before he shows up and you find out it's just a bunch of it, uh, the more uh, successful branch of Avalanche shows up. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about mm-hmm. <laughs> before it like they sh- it showed who was showing up I thought it was going to be Wu-Tai I thought like a, a, an insurgent team of Wu-Tai agents was about to show up and like they were going to just get out of there because they're caught in the middle type of thing but it ended up just being some like a way more it's like a it was like being introduced to a different Dunder Mifflin branch for the first time when you watch The Office. You're yeah. like, "Whoa, there are other branches." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good analogy. That's perfect. <laughs> what the fuck's going on here? Yeah, it's really weird the way Avalanche was portrayed in this game. So, in the original FF7, and you know, this could be an age thing because I played the original FF7 when I was a teenager. I'm playing the remake as a middle-aged 30 year old and uh i have to say that the the portrayal of avalanche feels way different in the original game i always thought of avalanche as freedom fighters like they they came off as like this ragtag group of freedom fighters and in the remake they're like well-meaning but kind of dopey terrorists yeah, I thought when you first get off the train and you see some of the devastation, <laughs> I mean, then there you're going through that slow mo walk scene where you're just like, I can't believe this happened. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm just like, oh shit, they're really trying to paint these guys as <laughs> some bad people. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It, it it felt like they just pushed it. Like you're meant to feel bad for what you're doing, and in the original, it felt like you're in the right. You know what I mean? Like, you, you're going through it, you're like, you felt like, yeah, I'm the good guy. And in this one, I swear to God, there are certain scenes where I was like, oh, fuck, man. Is this game going to basically, the, is the upside down castle, quote unquote, of this game going to be that you're the bad guy? That Avalanche is the bad guy and you were the villain the whole time. And that Shinra was actually the good guy is misunderstood. I really yeah. honestly thought that for a while and t- until things kind of went back to normal later on. Yeah, but that goes back to the crackpot theory, dude, with Seth Roth doing some time travel. Dude. Yeah, Maybe he's just doing some insidious shit where he's just <laughs> slowly tweaking little aspects of the original plot. So it mm-hmm. plays out differently. You know, he's like, I know the pl- the path to success. I just have to do these things. <laughs> so what did I'm- you think about the Bollywood scene in the honey band? <laughs> Okay, so when you're in the closet, right? <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> when you're, or when you're in the the dressing room or whatever, and you're doing the practice thing with your sword, I was like, that's really odd. He's just like slashing in the air. I was like, if you're going to do a dance simulation, you might as well have Cloud dance. And then it went drastically <laughs> into that direction. I was like, okay, I asked for too much. <laughs> That was wild. I expected I expected the honeybee in to be 
the same over the top you know well i expected it to be different in a couple ways you know but like i expected it, it to be censored it, that's it what i expected not, it wasn't at all. no it wasn't at all i'm happy about like, that he, they had they had uh transgender uh, <laughs> weightlifters they had uh uh gay twinks wanting cloud they had fat rape rapist drug addicts <laughs> wanting pretty christian looking girls they had <laughs> they had it all <laughs> even you even saw which i thought was crazy you saw the t i think that was from the original game too the um one of the orphanage uh teacher that oh, yeah. Aerith, you end up seeing her in Honey Bean in, in the original, don't you? But it's not a thing. Yeah, it actually so, gets you stuck for a while because you don't know where she's at. Yeah, so, okay, so I'm going to say yes, but in the remake, they give her dialogue. I don't think... Yeah, okay, you, yeah. Yeah, I don't think that you could talk to her, and if you could talk to her in the original, I don't think she said quite as much, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, it felt more on the nose in the remake. For sure. I guess my point being is, is that they set her up as being a teacher... And then they show you her in a honeybee costume. I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> I loved it. I love the the non-restraint. Because yeah, in this it climate, refreshing. it's so easy to just give in to like all of the the voices that you are told are prevalent in your community, but actually aren't. And to change your game to appease these people. And I feel like Square really sent a message. And you know, this isn't uncommon with Japanese developers. Japanese developers are basically holding the flag for this type of stuff right now because most of the Western developers are capitulating and they're giving in. And uh, I really respected Square's stance on this. Yes, Cloud is going to cross-dress. Yes, he's not transgender. No, he is not gay. Uh, no, is he not going to support this? And he is going to treat it as a lark just like it actually is. I did not see any censorship at all in this game from a purely political standpoint. I didn't Dude, see any political censorship. The hand job scene, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that was insane. <laughs> I can't believe they like the you know, the the insinuations <laughs> they had. <laughs> and then I, mean, I was just like, wow, children are going to play this game and there was some moments in that uh, part of the story where it's just like, wow, yeah, this is not a rated M game. This is no. for teenagers. Yeah, no, I mean, it makes sense, dude. I played this game as a teenager, and dude, if you were to ask me, did you think anything in FF Seven was inappropriate for the age you were when you played it? I'd give you an enthusiastic fuck no. No, Are you, dude. Give, give me a fucking break, dude. I saw faces of death when I was 17. It changed you my have. life. <laughs> and it, you're going to tell me, oh, the fucking little joke in FF7 is going to ruin kids. Oh, fuck off. It matters your uh, fortitude of the mind. Some people truly enter the upside down castle when they see shit like that and they don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, uh, one other thing I want to talk about, they brought the gold saucer date scene to Midgar. I don't even know if you noticed this or not, but there's a point in, I think, I want to say chapter 14, around there, where you're at Aerith's house and you're spending the night. And depending on who you were nicest to, just like the date scene in Gold Saucer, in the middle of the night you wake up and you go out into the uh, Aerith's flower garden and you talk with someone. And you have like a little kind of date scene i got tiffa because tiffa is a wholesome waifu she's the best waifu and anyone that prefers Aerith can burn in hell broadcaster nichols who did you get in this date scene i got tiffa that's right i, I respect your decision no man i, I got barrett, <laughs> barrett was yeah. out of the field. that was the first thing i thought of though when uh when this happened, I quickly realized this was the date scene. Like, it, not at the very beginning of it. At the very beginning, I'm like, oh, I don't quite remember this, but maybe I, you know, it's been a while. So maybe I just don't remember this, but it's in the game. And then well, it's, once okay. it, it's a hybrid of a of a moment that was yeah. in the original. Once it gets to the end, I in in like like Cloud starts like hugging Tiffa and like consoling her and stuff. And she's crying in his arms. And I'm just like, oh, fuck. This is the date scene. And, and 
And then I was then like, you wait became a Jack Nicholson. <laughs> and you're just like, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what I did is I was like, fuck, I could have got the Barrett date and I didn't even try. I was pissed. Because I was like, wait a second, I'll bet anything you can get Barrett. I don't think so. Do I think, think it was so? between I think it was between Aerith and Tiffa and maybe somehow Jesse. But mm, oh. because Jesse, those oh. were the three, wait those a second, Jesse's dead girls? at that point. So is Jesse's ghost coming, or do you think Jesse's actually alive? Maybe you talk to Jesse in the field, <laughs> like the flowers, and you hear Jesse's thoughts. I'm not sure. That would be but the dark that was, horse candidate right there. Well, those were the three characters that you kind of had the date simulation with. Oh, that was weird. Wasn't like making it? the did. pizza. Same thing with Tiffa, though. You could say that Jesse isn't anything to Tiffa. Tiffa asks you if what's up with you and Jesse, or no, what's up with you and Aerith? Sorry. Mm-hmm. And you can say nothing. She's nothing to me. You're everything to me, baby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I purposely answered every question, Tiffa. Yeah, I was like Tiffa's original wife, who number she, one. She oh, is whatever. like, I don't <laughs> even care if her tits went from like a triple G down to like a single D or whatever. So they went from super unrealistic <laughs> to semi unrealistic. All right, whatever. There is not a Weebu alive <laughs> that will not accept Tiffa remakes breasts. All right, I don't care who you <laughs> are. You will accept them, and you know it. But the best part of the remake was the Shinra HQ, which was like, I think it encompassed about three chapters. But either way, that Shinra HQ part, to me, was the best part of the game. It had the best string of boss fights, it had the best amount of story. You had fucking, you had Hojo doing facial expressions that I didn't even know were possible. Like, I'm just looking at him, like, the way he's, like, moving his mouth and laughing and shit. I'm just like, this is what I wanted. When when well, he Mike was like an anime villain, he, he was. Like, was. <laughs> He's like, fight my experiment, bitch. I'm going to the next room. <laughs> oh, dude, that whole segment with him uh, after you kill uh, specimen H O five one two or whatever. That was great, dude. Like, he's just toying with you like a fucking piece of shit, and he's just, like, throwing random shit at you, like, eh, <laughs> later, losers, and he just go away, and, <laughs> like, do these weird fucking facial expressions. That was the part where I was like, this is it. This is what <laughs> I wanted. I get where you're going, Daniel, all right? I get where you're going, and I agree for the most part, but there was one critical character-developing scene that they left out with the Hojo arc, right? And I think we both know. This was the one censorship. This, this was it. his greatest plan. This it was, was his greatest. <laughs> this is his magnum opus. Daniel. You're talking about. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, you're talking about where, where he was like, hmm, perhaps I shall have Red 13 impregnate Aerith, right? That's what you're talking about. Like the, the, the yeah. cat rape scene. <laughs> yeah. I remember, why. I remember reading that as a child. I'm like, whoa. That was kind of dark. I mean, it was dark. But hey, <laughs> times are dark, right? Here's my theory on it. I think that Sony has rules against bestiality, and I think they wouldn't let them do it. No, I'm not even. I'm not even playing. This isn't. This isn't like some out there crack seller. Most perverted theory. nation in the world. They right. Got something against bestiality. I, dude, bestiality is banned in almost every country on the planet, including Japan. Yeah, it's because it's because it's fucking gross. Right. It should be banned. I agree, but I don't think that fucking hilarious villain references to it like Hojo should be banned because I think that was fucking hilarious and I loved it. I just don't like the reality of it. You know what I'm saying? It's cool. Ban the reality of it. But let's let Hojo, let's let Hojo be Hojo. It's the implication. (laughs) None of these girls are going to get hurt. (laughs) (laughs) Pixels have no age. Just ask the creator of Made of an Abyss. (laughs) <laughs> okay uh yikes <laughs> yikes <laughs> alert alert uh i love the way they let you sabotage Airbuster. that was one of my so like we're talking about a lot of new stuff that sucked right and i i feel like i'm probably over critical on the new stuff i want to be really clear there's some new stuff i loved and one of them is the way they let you sabotage Airbuster. that was really cool it reminded me of mega man like when I was oh, doing that sure. mission, yeah. I'm just like, dude, this is like playing Mega Man X Command mission. I loved it. I loved that mechanic. And you have a really good point, too, because the parts that you ultimately end up getting are lackluster. I mm-hmm. thought they were going to play into something more like a Mega Man cat. Like, oh, are we going to build our ultimate weapons with these <laughs> parts? And you got to, like, play multiple playthroughs to get all the parts or something. No, nothing. They're just throwaway items. 
They, yeah, they are. But it, it added this like layer of complexity to the way you could sabotage Airbuster and you could make them easier in a certain aspect, but not too much in either. I have a soft spot for boss modifications. It's a rare element in RPGs. Most RPGs do not let you modify the boss. You can modify your characters to fight the boss, but you cannot modify the boss. And I really loved how they did that. And I hope that that is the trend in the future chapters and the ch- the future versions of this game that come out. I hope they keep that type of stuff going. I think they definitely will. I think it definitely will. I can't wait to honestly see how they're going to do like Bahamut Zero. <laughs> you know, like, are we going to take off in a sh- spaceship? <laughs> And stuff. No, is that no, all no. gonna happen still like he's gonna he's God, gonna go up into sense. space and then he's gonna hit like a glass wall and you realize space isn't real then like a picture of eddie bravo's head's gonna appear in <laughs> front of him and be like bro you're on a disc okay uh favorite boss fight let's exclude sethroff i don't even know if sethroff would be your choice or not but let's just exclude the i think you always got to kind of exclude the final boss because the final boss is always kind of made to be the coolest. Hmm. Probably the train yard boss, like the, the final one. That one was super oh, cool. The demon on like the chariot. Yeah. That yeah, one was, was super cool. cool. I liked that one. But if I'm really thinking about it, I think it would be Rufus. Hmm. Rufus made me actually think I was like, wait a minute. I actually have to like, counter this motherfucker and maybe you had to do it in other matches they were just so easy i just brute force past it what they were intending me to do but in rufus's fight it was not in a negotiation <laughs> you had no. to you had to do the match a certain way oh you had to phase two out, for sure though. they didn't tell you you had to figure it out which is like why i think the the match is my favorite yeah. i think that rufus is close to my favorite but he's edged out a little bit by Specimen HO512. I loved the lead-up to Specimen HO512. I loved that boss in the original game, and I loved the way they portrayed him in the remake. I thought, A, this is another three-phase boss fight, just like Rufus. Uh, uh, The first phase is a joke, just like Rufus. The second phase is isn't that hard either. It's the final phase of Specimen H0512 that's really difficult. And I love the cinematography of it. First of all, it's like a they make it, they kind of lean into like the Cthulhu demon shit with this monster in the remake. (laughs) They lean into it. And the way that they make the mechanics of the boss fight have like these little brain bug things that he continually brings up. Then in the final phase, like he like puts like some light of God on them and like their eyes all light up and like they do this crazy cinema effect as it comes back to the party to start phase three. I fucking love that. It was pretty dope. I thought the difficulty was perfect. And I also loved the mechanics of the fight because each phase was very different. In certain phases, you had to kind of stay back a little bit and kind of just use spells and kind of stay back. But in other phases, you need to be up on his ass killing that left arm or whatever his appendage was. I really enjoyed the strategy of that boss fight and the portrayal of it, the Hojo's part of it, where he's like, hmm, I'm wondering what will happen if I present your fresh corpses to Aerith. (laughs) Cthulhu, come to me. Like, it was so perfect. I love that shit. I have to say, I enjoyed that boss fight the most. Let's go to least favorite boss fight. Who is your least favorite boss in this game? There's a few of them, but I'm probably going to have to say the monster. They're bipedal creatures. You're talking about the one where, like, you, as Tifa, like, Barrett throws you up there, and then you have to fight him on the bridge, and then he breaks the bridge, yeah. right? Yep, yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. No, I agree. That was one of that was one of the worst boss fights. I didn't know what to do sure. in that boss fight for a second. I was like, "What am I doing?" And then I realized I could get off the 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 bridge if I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a really weird one, and it it felt kind of like it was uh, tacked on a little bit. One of those boss fights where the love and care the rest of the game got, you didn't feel it in that boss fight. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Well, I'm going to have to disagree with you. My least favorite boss fight is Hell House. 
I thought Hell House was retarded. <laughs> I thought it was the dumbest fight in the game. It was the most pointless fight in the game. The mechanics were unfair. They were stupid. And they were annoying, and you always, and this is one of my biggest gripes, and this comes from the MMORPG player in me, you always wipe on Hell House at the very fucking end. So when you wipe, it's like, you didn't just play the fight for a minute, and then you wipe and you start over. You were at the very fucking end. You were, like, on it for 9 minutes, 37 seconds, or whatever. Then you wipe. I fucking, I one shot, or I, I, I did it on my first try. I almost, I did remember when it was aggroing at the end, I almost did wipe, but I got it. I thought the mechanics were stupid, and I really just wish they would have nixed it. Just throw something in new, like, throw something in, like, oh, these are, like, the rejects of the Turks. Yeah. Like, these are, like, no the shit. B-team Turks that no one knows about, you never saw yeah. before, and they got rejected from Turk Academy. Fight For sure. Them. Let's Hell be House real was here. dumb. All the things they kept true and changed in that game. They decided to keep Hell House from the original. And they broke their backs trying to figure out how they can make it relevant in the mm-hmm. new game instead of just getting rid of it. Yeah, they should have gotten rid of it. It was dumb in the first game. It was even dumber in the, the remake. Honestly, that was my low point with the FF7 remake. When I was fighting Hell House, I'm just like, this is dumb. Why am I fighting a stupid cottage that moves and it's like, okay, I get it. Eventually, a demon comes out of it. and uh, Okay, whatever. It's dumb. It's a dumb fight. <laughs> I think it should have been erased. Thanos would have erased it. Broadcaster Nichols, are you ready for our segment, The Hit, The Miss, and The Whiff? I am. Broadcaster Nichols, what is your hit? My hit is probably going to be probably Shinra HQ. Shinra the HQ, level, the level itself. Yeah, that that was probably just the most polished, well done. I had entertain. I never got bored the whole time I was in the Shinra HQ. I just wanted to play it all the mm-hmm. way through. I didn't want to save. I just was like, I gotta play all this. <laughs> it's definitely the hit for me. the The hit for me is a little bit more esoteric. It was the battle system. So when I first went into the FF Seven Remake Rabbit Hole. The very first concern I had was the battle system. I knew it wasn't going to be turn-based. I liked FF15, but I did not want FF7 Remake to have the FF15 straight-up FF15 engine. And luckily it didn't. We already talked about the battle system, so I'm not going to like harp on it too much. But I do believe that this is the best modern JRPG battle system that has ever happened. Like, it is the gold standard now. The way they incorporate ATB into action combat strategically, letting you dodge out of moves, letting you block out of moves, and also giving you materia that modifies your blocking, dodging, and attack options, it was perfect to me. And I thought they fucking nailed it. They took all the best parts of FF13 and FF15 and they kind of just combined it into the best parts of FF7, and that's what we got. Because I expected them to nail all the shit that already happened. Like, what, you're taking the storyline from the original game? I'm not going to give you credit for that, but I will give you credit for nailing this battle system. For sure. That being said, what is the miss? I think the miss for me is side quest. I think that is just poor taste. Like, it just came off so generic, vanilla, phoned in, most of the side quests. There's a couple side quests that are outliers, but nonetheless, mm. that's just, that's just, that stands out to me as the miss, for sure. Yeah, and, and on this one, we were, we are in total concurrence. The side quests were atrocious. I made it a point to do all of them. Some I think that's what good. made it feel so bad. <laughs> yeah, some were good. Very few, like you said, like there are a few outliers. Most of them were generic fetch quests from GTA level NPCs that just like they're almost insulting to your intelligence. Like they're like, hey, FF7 fanboy, I know you want to get the most hours out of this game. How about you go do this dumb thing that you would never do in any other game? But because it's FF7, you're going to do it. (laughs) Slave. (laughs) No shit. (laughs) But I will give a call out. Even though we're talking about the miss, I'll give a call to the one quest I thought was really good. The one where they send you back into the uh, secret lab and you fight behemoth type zero. That is how all of the side quests should have been. And on that note, broadcaster Nichols, what is the whiff? 
He's a four-legged animal oh, shit. called Red 13. <laughs> oh, shit. That was the whiff to me. It kind of just put a bad taste in my mouth because it, when I first saw it, I was just like, all right, this was lazy. This was lazy. I was like, nah, it's not lazy. It's just more of a product of how things played out. You know, it's like they chose where they wanted the first part to end. And I think maybe maybe this is the real whiff. Maybe it's not Red 13, but where they chose to end and make the giant plot twist happen in the first part of the game. I think they should have extended it out a little bit. Maybe maybe when you make it to Calm is when the gate to hell opens up with Seth Roth. Or, you know, something mm. that allows you to get a little bit more time naturally with Red 13 and make him feel more fleshed out. Because the fact that he was there... Definitely a character that was semi-developed but not playable. Just was like, man, you're already giving me this game in parts. There's all this controversy. Now you're telling me it's a reboot. Now I don't get to play Red 13. You're telling me too many bad things. <laughs> that sticks out. <laughs> so um, I think I think that's the that's the whiff for me. Red 13. My whiff, and I I consider this a hard whiff, is the hip hop remixes. <laughs> they did on some of the fucking songs in this game. So we kind of alluded earlier in our non-spoiler segment about how the music is kind of a big disappointment. And we didn't really kind of go into detail on why. I'm going to tell you now. It is because, inexplicably, for several songs, they decided to do hip-hop remixes. It's like the weirdest shit. There are meme videos out there. It's a joke. Like, it's like horns, like trying to be like gangster pop music, but like combining it with the chocobo theme. It is jarring. It is desperate. And it comes off as, hey, kids, we know we're remaking a game that your parents love. We want you to love it, too. So, like, <laughs> fucking dumb ass shit. And it, the, the, the big thing that really sucks about it is that not too many songs got this treatment, but the ones that did were played a lot. There was like yeah. one level that had it that you had to go through like five times if you did all the side quests. And then if you use the chocobo. Yikes. Every time you use the choke. So again, they punished people that did the side quests. If you did the side quests, you heard the chocobo hip hop pop weird remix thing. Every time you got on the chocobo, every time you went on like the underground highway that connects sector seven to was it sector five where all the bandits live and shit. It's just like inexplicable. We're trying to be hip guys. We're hip. Please like us. I thought it, it was, was a super, super jarring track. It was it, super jarring. It was just a bad look. And I know for a fact, Nobu Omatsu was not on board. <laughs> he was not. No fucking with this way, shit. dude. <laughs> There's no <laughs> way he signed off on that. <laughs> and for that, that is the whiff. No, it's, it's the whiff. <laughs> it is the whiff. And it is a big fucking whiff. Any final thoughts you have on this FF7 remake as it stands? It isn't ultimately the final Final Fantasy VII remake I wanted, but it was the one I needed. <laughs> because that's at a, the end... That's a great way to put it. Because at the end, I kind of got mad as I was slowly turning... It was it, I was slowly coming to the grips that this is not going to go the way you want it to. Or how you originally wanted it to. But then, as you sit on it, you're just like, well, that's awesome. <laughs> but they're even doing this. Yeah. Because now, I get to play Final Fantasy VII all over again. Yes. Like, it's new. <laughs> and it's like, key. it's the thing I didn't even know I wanted. You know, yeah. you gave me something I did not know I wanted. All right? And that is why it's good. <laughs> and it's all because Square is a master of deception. Like, from now God. on, when I think Can about you imagine game this backfired? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Before we give our official Joker rating for FF7 Remake, let's do one final experiment. Now that part two is completely unpredictable. What do you think's going to happen in part two? Because generically speaking, we should go through Calm, 
We should run into the Turks a few times. We should get to that beach town where we fight Leviathan. We'll go across the sea, eventually get to Gold Saucer. You know, like we have like this set list of things that should happen in part two. But I don't think any of it's going to happen now. I have a feeling we're going to get a totally different series of events. And I want to know what you think is going to happen in that series of events. I think the, I mean, naturally I would, I would believe that they're going to talk about more of the soldier project. I think Roche is going to come in to fill a lot of the void. That is, is them cutting off some of the old content and replacing it with, with new content. I think Roche is going to be a lot of, uh, be, uh, be a huge part of that. And then I also think that there's going to be the game. I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel about these words leaving my mouth, but it, I feel like the second part of Final Fantasy is really just going to be you going to like five, maybe six different areas, you know, like calm coast of day, a soul or whatever the fuck it's called. Um, and then Did you say Costa de la Sol. <laughs> it's Costa de Sol or something like it that. It is. It's Costa de Sol, yeah. but you said de yeah. la Sol, right? That's, oh yeah, de la Sol. Hey, <laughs> that's a good band, all right? <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> uh, but yeah, and then ultimately making it to Gold Saucer and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I think that I, I almost, I wouldn't want to say that part two is going to end with the Gold Saucer, but it's probably going to be close to the end. Mm. It's probably going to be almost like an end game area, Ooh. if you will. Ooh. For, yeah. What if we like actually have like levels in Gold Saucer, like not like we're just in Gold Saucer hanging out, but like Gold Saucer gets fucked up and we're like in there fighting bitches and shit. That'd be crazy. It would. But be. I, I kind of want if there's one thing that they need to keep true to the original to 100 percent, if not make it 300 percent is golden saucer i want to see their original idea of golden saucer fleshed out like times 10 dude i I, because imagine how massive they could make golden saucer now it was massive for the time oh dude like imagine you could get lost in gold saucer back in the day (laughs) you could and like they proved that they've already nailed the snowboarding minigame by like uh, the levels where you have clouds like sliding down broken uh, roads. You know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. proved that they already have the snowboarding minigame done. That's what that is. They just incorporated yeah. it into like this little, you know, slide down a road thing. But this is my part two prediction. I think that part two is going to start in Wutai and I think it's going to end in Calm. I think they're going to fully embrace the upside down castle nature of this remake. They're going to totally flip the way it progresses. And when you get to calm, it is going to usher in disc three. And I don't think you're going back into that final dungeon that you fought Seth Roth in and disc three of FF seven original. I think the final is going to be back to Midgar. I think we're going back to Midgar in this third part and that calm at the end of the second part is going to set up your return to Midgar. That'd be weird. It just, they're going backwards. Right. But it makes sense when you think about the way that Wu Tai was described, like the way that they went out of their way to like paint Wu Tai as like their enemy. And like, Oh, there's these big bad guys and avalanche is all on board with Wu Tai and they're, they're puppets of Wu Tai and blah, blah, blah. It just makes sense for me that avalanche a.k.a. the group leaving Midgar, the A-team of Avalanche, is going to go straight to Wutai and try and figure out what the fuck's going on. I just have a feeling that things are going to happen in a much different set of outcomes, and I don't think we're going through the map the same way we did the first time. I think it's very clear that we're not we're not going from Calm to the Chocobo Farm, to the cave where you fight the Turks, to that seaside town you fight leviathan across the beach to costa del sol to gold saucer to cosmo canyon yada 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 we're not going in that direction and i have a feeling we're going in the opposite direction because we are now in opposite land where i have a feeling setheroth isn't even going to be a bad guy in the end something there is something about this remake that has convinced me that everything up is now down and that extends to the progression of disc two I don't know if I'll go as as far as that, but 
I, I definitely something's definitely up with Seth Roth. There's no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. it. Something has changed with him. I don't know if they'll ultimately make him into like a anti protagonist. If we're talking about Ultimate Universe, the second part just starts off with Cloud in Wu Tai in his uh, day state in the wheelchair. Doesn't remember who he is. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> you just and that would that would give a good that would give him a good excuse to usher in new characters without the the shadow of Cloud. Cloud's disabled for a while all right just leave him alone mm-hmm. <laughs> and think about how cool the 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 mental breakdown would play out when the the earth cracks and he goes into the live stream for a mm-hmm. second and he's like three people three of himself are talking to him <laughs> well i guess we will find out in like 15 years when part two comes out <laughs> yes we will christy yes we will <laughs> broadcaster nichols what is your official joker rating for FF7 remake. S plus plus. Plus plus. We're going beyond the system. All right. <laughs> this is no longer a Joaquin Phoenix. This is Joaquin Phoenix and No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Joaquin Phoenix. No. And Jack yes. Nicholson. I was gonna I was trying to decide which how they were gonna fuse, but they do the dance. No Patara rings. Patara rings are for pussies. They do the dance, and they make something new. <laughs> and that is S plus <laughs> plus. Yes, you, yes. Uh, so, so you're gonna be a Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of people are gonna be surprised by that, based off of like the conversation we've had about this game. I was on the fence between. Heath Ledger and Jack Nicholson for a large part of this game. But then Shinra HQ came. And then Chapter 18 came, where they pulled the rug underneath from you. And, I, dude, I can't remember any games of recent memory that did something like that to me. This is a special event in gaming history. We have a remake of one of the greatest RPGs of all time, one of the greatest video games of all time, that makes you think it's a goddamn straight-laced remake all the way to the last hour. And then they're like, yo, bro, no. This is a new game. You have been playing a new game. Everything you thought was true about this game was actually false, and you just thought it was true. And we told you we were giving you the original, but what we were really giving you is the stealth reboot. And this... The death of the original. (laughs) This, my friend, is the best way to do a reboot they nailed it they nailed it to a fucking cross and sanctified it and for that i give this game a joaquin phoenix and with that we will close out uh am a man was that like five hours what was that it's at least seven what